132 and Dr. Warren Booth's here. Let's go through the sponsor shout outs really quickly. Shane Kelly, Small Town Exotics. He has a bunch of snakes for sale. You need to go buy them, please. <laughs> Lots of little ball pythons. He had a sale and I think he's going to run another sale whenever the auctions renew. Shane Kelly, Small Town Exotics. Check him out. He had those like red stripe Krypton things that are very cool. Bravo Zulu Ball Python. She'll be at the Midwest Reptile Show at the Indiana State Fairgrounds on this weekend, actually, the 25th. Please go there and say hi. Give her, buy some of her snakes so she can go buy more Dominican Red Mountain Boas. We love that. Thank you, Bravo Zulu Ball Pythons. Donate to Ball Pythons. I still don't have an update from him, <laughs> Justin. I'm assuming he's still uh, happily keeping snakes. And living his best life. Stone Age Ball Pythons. Power House Ball Pythons. Andrew. Um, lots of pairings going on. No eggs yet. He did have a, a okay auction. I think he bought more snakes than he sold. So hit up Andrew to buy some more snakes, please. Power House Ball Pythons. <laughs> Great family stakes. They are doing the Huntsville, Alabama Repticon on February 24th and 25th. Please check them out if you're in the area. Lots of cool pairings this year. Um, we love that. They also need to buy more Sanzania. So buy some of their snakes so they can upgrade. Chris and Venus Reptilia, he'll be on tomorrow because we're doing a Pituophis party episode. I tried to get pictures of every Pituophis who, that has ever existed, basically. And I'm currently failing because some of them are such rare hypothetical subspecies. But we'll try to talk about... All the kinds of pituophis in the whole hobby and which species are just locality only, which ones have morphs, and uh, maybe we're going to make it fun. He will also be doing a show this weekend, February 24th, at the New Hamburg Show in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. All right. I did it. Warren, how are you? Wonderful. How are you? <laughs> I'm so bad at ad reads. Why do these people pay me any money at all? I oh, know it's weird. I um, we haven't done that in the podcast that I'm involved with. We haven't uh, we haven't expanded out to the whole sponsor thing. It's too much work. I just want to get on and just talk junk for two hours. And me too. <laughs> and, and they all renewed, and I'm like, you don't have to renew. I was kind of being like passive aggressive about it, right? I was like, you don't have to. <laughs> That's the way to do it, because then they feel guilty at that point. Right, but I, I was being serious. Like, you know, it's tough at economic times. I don't know if I'm, like, driving value to their brand. I try hard. Like, I, I bring them on and be like, what's your projects or whatever, but I don't know. I don't know how to do anything on the internet. But they're all ball python breeders, right? So they're all making loads of money at the moment, right? They're not <laughs> running sales or auctions and... Like they're not losing money hand over fist, right? That is the hardest thing I have ever heard. <laughs> Yeah. How so, happy are you to be out of ball pythons? I've never been happier. Oh my gosh! You know, I, I like I like them. I still like them, and I still think about getting one or two just as little pets. You know, I I've looked at the um, the patternless from Tracy Barker a whole bunch of years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I like tri stripe. And, Me too. Uh, but and it's weird because tri stripe don't seem to be getting the recognition that they. Really should. I think part of it, because whenever you cross it with anything, it kind of just ruins the whole pattern, unless it's something like Ultramel or something like that there. Mm -hmm. But um, but then when I think about those and think about getting one or two, I then realize that that's the stupidest thing to be thinking about. And I could rather just throw my money into the sky and walk away. So Right. Yeah. Do you think one day, I mean, I spend a lot of time like pontificating about what ball pythons could be like if ball pythons were less an, an investment species people would like i don't know enjoy them and like breed breed less of them and so they'd be like more stable value i think until people that have them think about them in in, in a way that it's not an investment because realistically they're not for for 90 percent of the people that have them they're going to lose money or they'll just about break even mm -hmm. right there's a small proportion that will uh, make money and the problem with a lot of it is you get 90 percent of the people following one percent of the breeders and following what they do so and they got to realize that those breeders are already several years ahead of them and producing a boatload of those 
So you're right, and they've already that. made their money and moved on. Yeah, and then you're three the, years or four years right. after that. And it, you know, just look on morph market. It's kind of scary how much of, there's three or four key morphs that are all of a sudden, you know, there's everyone's got them because that's what the big breeders are doing. You know, if right. you want to try and do something in any field, try and try and kind of carve your own your own channel and your own path and get into into things that are a little bit more interesting. You know, that not everybody is all of your competitors have. Yeah, it's kind of it's because of like the the covid babies and like me too. Like I'm I'm part of the problem, right? Like you're trying to like hyper optimize so you have a chance of selling them for more than they cost to make. <laughs> but then you all end up hyper optimizing the exact same way. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's not and then the good. other thing is that whenever it's just about adding genes to genes to genes, they all end up looking pretty crappy, the more mm -hmm. genes you add to them. And and as a result, instead of producing like really the best of the best, you know, single or, you know, you know, two gene combinations, then people try to put on five or six of these different genes and they end up having to get genetic testing to even determine what they are. And it's because they're a powerhouse. <laughs> you know <laughs> i know it's so funny no, i mean we yeah, sort of no has thanks. have the same problem in like morph boas like it could be an inca key west jungle hypo yeah. img there's not, many, like, there's not a, there's not as many people doing that i don't think there's a handful right at, right they're really doing that i think i don't want to say boa people are smarter but we there's are a, <laughs> there's at least an <laughs> emphasis on like you know like I don't know, some selective breeding. Like if it takes you that long to raise up the females, she might as well be the best version of mm -hmm. it possible. Yeah. Not yeah. just any slop you got at the show every time. Yeah, that's it. Because what you got to realize is that while we're looking at genes as being a single recessive gene, for example, there's also dozens of genes underlying that there that are also resulting in a lot of the pattern and color variation on mild levels, right? Mm -hmm. So really, ultimately, it's very polygenic in a sense of the overall look of the animal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you are just thinking, I'm going to buy a pastel or I'm going to buy whatever, you need to buy the best of the best that you can find and mm -hmm. breed only the best of the best. But a lot of people just, you know, they've got X amount of money and they want to buy as many things as they can mm -hmm. and think that they're going to make the best from them. And that's not necessarily the case, you know, not, yeah, sure. You can pop out great looking animals from very inferior looking animals, but it's more likely you're going to produce really good quality animals from really good quality animals. So right. People will still, people still want the best of the best. You know, they will pay for them. Well, this I guess leads into the first topic. Like when se selective breeding for quality, are we interested in <clears throat> introducing too much homozygosity for that line to be viable? Really? Like I always think about that. I'm like, yeah. I, but then, like, I don't know the inbreeding coefficient for my whatevers, corn snakes, leopard yeah, the, or whatever. That's going to be a difficult thing, right? Realistically when we think about inbreeding, we got to think about it in terms of natural populations, all right? Because mm -hmm. they're largely random breeding populations. There's multiple males and multiple females to compare over time and produce relatedness values that are closer to zero. So for those that don't, you know, think about relatedness values, full siblings are 0.5 because they share half their genetic material from the mother and half from the father. And ultimately that means that they, when they compare siblings to each other, they, they share about 50%. Mm -hmm. um, parent offsprings, 50%. Um, full sibling, sorry, um, half siblings, 0.25, and you go from there. Um, highly inbred, you're going to skew that up to the other end, closer to one. So a parthenogen is going to be close to one, but not completely one. And highly uh, um, unrelated is going to be close to zero, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is that with relatedness values among individuals, because we're not really breeding randomly, we're buying specific animals and pairing them continually. Mm -hmm. Right, we're we're pairing siblings or half siblings or, you know, whenever you get these new traits, then everything from it's going to be a half sibling or a or a, you know a, a full sib, you know, for a, a, a period of time. People don't really outbreed. They should outbreed because mm. the more inbreeding you get, the more the increased homozygosity you've got. Um, the greater the level of homozygosity, it can go two ways. So inbreeding is detrimental in some cases and beneficial in others because it can be beneficial because it can purge mildly deleterious alleles very rapidly mm -hmm. it can it can purge significantly deleterious alleles very rapidly because they're the offspring that, that are not going to survive right but what it does do is that it also loses diversity and when you lose diversity you lose adaptive potential mm -hmm. and um 
and, and sadly, you know, in the genetic studies that we've done relating to parthenogenesis, we're always already screening, um, you know, the mothers or, or potential fathers from of those. And there, mm -hmm. it, it, we've done ball pythons and reticulated pythons and boas and all that there. And they tend to have really low levels of heterozygosity. So there's been a lot of inbreeding over time. People don't choose to outbreed. You know, I've always said that the, the biggest mistake a lot of ball python breeders don't uh, make is that they don't take advantage of those really cheap imported female ball pythons mm -hmm. because once you get your multi-gene animal that you want outbreed it to wild stock and it introduces genetic diversity then breed back from there you know and they, and they don't seem to take advantage of that because but what we don't know really is to how many generations can we go before things going really bad with 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 reptiles some of them seem to do really well mm -hmm. boas on islands seem to do really well Many island snakes do, uh, and, and, and lizards do very well with inbreeding levels, um, but we just don't know in captivity. We're seeing evidence, you know, like where you get, you know, kink tails and bulging eyeballs or eyeballs falling out or small eyeballs and stuff like that there. Um, you know, we don't know how much of that is associated with the trait or associated with inbreeding. Right. Like, <clears throat> I'm assuming in the situation with island snakes, you have the founder effect whatever the deleterious alleles either weren't there to begin with or were bred out right away. Otherwise they all would yeah. have died. Right? Right. right. But when we're taking like a small number of animals from a mainland population, like Brisbane coastals or Taramaras, and we just have a pair or two pairs mm -hmm. and that's all we have in captivity. Are we headed for? Potentially. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause look at, Look at rough scale pythons, but whether they were founded from five animals ultimately, and uh, you, but there's no way of introducing diversity to that. I have duns pythons. We can't really introduce much diversity to duns pythons, right? Right. Um, it's something I like worry about all the time because people will come on here and be like, "Why aren't you an Australian species?" And I'm like, "If I was going to get a carpet, I would get a Papuan carpet python." Mm -hmm. this yeah, because there's, there's at least imports coming in from that there. Yeah. For for yeah. now, right? It might stop, but like. Like I see a lot of cancer in carpet pythons and that just might be yeah. a carpet python feature, but it mm -hmm. also could be an inbreeding depression step one. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because we know that cancer is a heritable trait, mm -hmm. right? So it's, um, uh, we could certainly be selecting for individuals that have cancer or, or are predisposed to cancer. And remember that because it, it, an individual, a human or an animal has a gene that can predispose them to cancer doesn't mean they'll get cancer. Right. But it means that once the environmental triggers are there, then that can trigger cancerous growths and and you could have lines where they appear normal and then all of a sudden you start seeing cancer in lineages and that's because some environmental trigger changed and you're seeing that then uh, pop up you know for me it's i i try not to breed sibling to sibling mm -hmm. past one generation after that i'll i'll, I'll, I'll breed if i'm doing it to try and fix a trait then i'll outbreed immediately afterwards mm -hmm. um but i don't continue to do this inbreeding to inbreeding you know sibling to sibling to sibling um for some things you just can't avoid it like duns pythons for example we'll never well some wild caught come in here and there but um there's things that we can't avoid so you know i i look at it on a case-by-case -case basis um, if i can avoid it then i do mm -hmm. i'm also unlikely to live long enough to get past the number of generations where i need to worry about it as well but okay so you you feel Good about it. I don't it. feel terrible about it, but I, <laughs> I sometimes I feel terrible about it. Yeah. Some of these family well, trees yeah. are ladders, bro. And I'm like, right. And yeah, they're, they're just sticks, right? They're not, they don't even have branches. You and know, I'm like, I, what are we going to do? Yeah. Like, Tara think... bars are very cool, very cool, yeah. but we don't yeah. have very much. So, like, no, but so are crawl caves or cock acres or cocker caves or West Lagoon caves. They're all the same. They're coming from such a small, finding population and at some point in time because we've got i've got west lagoon k and crawl k and cocker k and all those kind of the ones from the original people that collected them so i've got the original lines um and i'll sequence those to see how much diversity is within those natural mm -hmm. kind of populations probably gonna be very little and the thing is that you know right some people would say well they're all bow imperator very mm -hmm. likely you know so we just outbreed them and then breed back but then you're losing that local adapted traits that makes them what they are so you know i one right. thing i just don't breed I, them too often and don't well there's not much you can do it is what it is <laughs> call out but, the ones that are looking really terrible right okay. right don't sell them but the ones that have got the, the third eyeball 
or the no eyeball or the legs instead of a tail you know feed that to your king snake yeah you know? please do for that stuff yeah. so you don't think i don't know like if we did a like a 50 percent outcross and bred back and I, like technically we could find ones that are like genes that down regulate igf1 we could get size mm-hmm. controlled or whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we could make it small and it wouldn't be pure but it would be it would phenotypically yeah. look like it and yeah maybe yeah, it wouldn't but, be so that, that that leads you down these kind of dark and <laughs> kind of pathways one is that you've got the people that want to retain pure lines and they're working to retain pure lines which means inbred lines and you've got the other ones in those cases that where you outcross them but then you don't know that everybody that buys those in time will not then represent them as mm-hmm. the pure line you know so that's always the problem and, and no matter what people say about genetic testing the likelihood that you're ever going to turn around and be able to test whether an animal is 100 percent pure tara hamara is less likely at least in the next five or ten years down the line we should be able to mm-hmm. because the cost of sequencing is reducing dramatically but it's not good we, we need animals from tarahumara to act as controls right that we can then compare to right so yeah I, no i agree i think you know i i have boa sigma and i got boa imperator from specific localities i had keep lines pure and when I can outbreed, I do. So for like hog islands, you know, people talk about, well, mine are only the Sears line or this or that. I've got Sears line and Shewitt line and University of Arkansas line and one other. And I um, I randomly, I outbreed those. So I don't breed Sears to Sears or Shewitt to Shewitt. I, mm-hmm. I'll breed Sears to Shewitt. And I think this year we've done Alabama to Shewitt or Arkansas to Shewitt, right? Um, I don't believe in those, keeping those lines because like, you can get different lines and you can outbreed. Right. So I think that's beneficial, but I've got other things where you can't do that, you know, and, and you just have to, 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 just to go with the animals that you've got. It's, um, it kind of sucks. Like I'm in a, I'm in a position where I can, I can, I can be a bit more selective because I can sequence their genomes and determine out of a litter, which ones are the most unrelated because not all individuals will be 50% related to each other. Right. Based on the genes, right. But that's like a good, I think people would pay for that hypothetically. Yeah, you think that, but it's not beneficial. It's not worth it for me. People have asked me about it before. But for me to do that, I need to have a technician. I need to be, so if I told them the hourly rate, then it's not going to be worthwhile. Okay. If I, it's not just the hourly rate of DNA extraction and library preparation. You know, you've then got the cost of the sequencing run, but then you've got the bioinformatic analyses afterwards. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, nobody's going to really want that. You know, what people want are, is my ball python had this or had that or whatever, right? And they'll do it with boas and they'll do it with a whole bunch of things, you know, so I'm like, and I'd thought about getting into that for a while. Right. Like we're, we're, we're doing a chromosome scale boa constrictor genome at the moment. So mm-hmm. we could certainly do all that. But again, it's just not worth it for me financially. You know, it, it from, I would need to have a, a technician being paid, I don't know, 70,000 a year plus fringe or 60,000 a year plus fringe benefits to be able to just keep up with all of that there. Yeah. You know, well, there, I guess you would have to have them cost. selling head tests too, yeah. like, in addition to it. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. So, like, that's why we didn't get, get, go any further with the um, sex determination tests. We developed them for a whole bunch of different species, but we just never marketed them because the university will also take a chunk of money. Right. The university mm-hmm. will say, right, we want 40% of this or 20% of this um, before you get anything. And just, it just makes everything very, very complicated. Was. This might be a spicy question. Uh, I'm not going to say this politely, but some other labs have been struggling with sex determination. In- yeah, in Python's it's a mess. I can't really talk about it at the moment, but we thought we isolated sex determination markers for green tree pythons. Mm-hmm. And then um, we did more work and we realized that it's not as simple as we thought. Um, so we're, we're still working through that um, with a collaborator. Um, but, uh, cause that's not really what my lab does anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. but, um, sex determination for green tree pythons for Morelia in general, other pythons are fine. Burmese pythons and stuff like that, they're fine. But if you, <laughs> if you can't sex your Burmese python, then there's a problem, um, for green tree pythons or for like diamond pythons, then they're a bit more tricky. Um, mm-hmm. but unfortunately their genome is also a little bit more tricky. So, all right. I guess we have, we have some questions. Have you seen any defects in Tara Mars? I have not, but also we don't see a lot of them being produced. Mm-hmm. And you then know, every year I might see one or two litters and they're small litters. 
Um, so I don't see a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you think ring pythons maybe have problems with inbreeding? Um, I Just don't know. Struggle. I, what do they struggle with? I, I, you know, the only struggle that I know with ring pythons is they dehydrate. You know, and they eat each other. It, yeah, but a lot of snakes do that. Though, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's inbreeding. <laughs> I've heard that as, as a it's trait. Just a that's struggle. Like inbreeding. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm not aware of of any kind of deleterious conditions with ring pythons, other than a predisposition to 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 dehydrate whenever the word water is mentioned. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, it's almost as if they know you're thinking about it, and then they will just decide to kill themselves by not drinking. But yeah, I'm not sure. And then Alex asks, can you sell the sex determination for blue tongues to RGI? Please. I cannot because it's considered part of the university um, uh, property. Property. Okay. Yeah. Dang it. I I had someone who was very popular in the in, and some people know this story. I'm not going to tell it who it was. Tried to get me to develop a test for that a number of years ago, and they would then market it themselves, and I would get a small percentage of the profits. But I was going to cost it was going to cost me all of my money to develop the test, and I would be doing all of the testing. But only I would be paid. I think it was like ten percent of the money that they would be getting. Yeah, sweet yes. deal. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> passed on that one. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Do you happen to know how many founder Tarhumars there were? I don't know. The, the whole story, the whole story of Mexican boas in general, I find very weird because there's not a lot of stories about who brought them in. Um, and a number of years ago, a very popular breeder of locality boas, not Vinrusum, was posting a lot of pictures on websites of Mexican boas, locality Mexican boas in their collection. And one day, and I'd approached this individual to ask for shared skin samples because we wanted to do a study that we ultimately ended up doing in collaboration with another group. But we wanted samples from localities in Mexico that this mm-hmm. individual had and was representing in the trade. A day on one of these forums before we had Facebook and stuff on one of the Facebook on one of the um, internet forums, they were posting all of these pictures, and several people from Mexico that lived in those areas said that their boas that were being posted do not represent the animals that they find in those areas. Oh no! And the individual told me that he wasn't going to send me he or she wasn't going to send me uh, samples because I was going to use it to my benefit to market my animals instead of theirs, even though I was only producing a couple of litters of Sonoran boas, mm-hmm. none of these weird ones. And then that person disappeared. So you, um, so whether they're actually Tarahumara or whether they're actually Tamalipas or whether, I don't really know, I can't tell you because um, unless we can compare them, and what, what I know is that in our study 10 years ago or so, we didn't have Tarahumara in our data set. We didn't have, I don't think we had, maybe we did have Tamalipas, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, we didn't have, the samples that we could then compare to the captive mm-hmm. lineages. And I'm not an individual that wants to go into very deepest, darkest Mexico to find samples of boas to then to try and then um, use as a as a way to um, determine whether Tara Humara is what it is. But I would imagine that the number of founders is very small, probably less than 10. Boa export from Mexico is illegal. Is that correct? <laughs> I've tried for the last two years to get paperwork to legally export um, albino Sonoran boas, and it's been to no avail. How did the uh, pied get out? I, I believe it crawled across the border. Very mysterious. And crawled, <laughs> and crawled its way into Arizona okay. and found its way into a FedEx box. Okay, excellent. Along with along with Sonoran T, um, T, T positive Sonorans. Um, mm-hmm. They are, and also apparently double heads. That is peculiar. How they made, they made a journey. They, are. <laughs> they made a journey. Um, whenever do you think I was the other pied ones animals, are imperator. Yes. Or you, they're from they're from Guatemala. They're, they're, I know, but they known. say they're from Guatemala. I'm like very paranoid now. Well, that that story is pretty well known. That whole okay. that whole story back. Yeah, there's there's data we can find history of that they're going way back okay coming out of Guatemala and sadly the person who brought them out as well is a bit of a shyster but um but yeah the the Sonoran ones because I you know I keep a lot of Sonoran bows I've got pure anarthristics and leopards and hypos and all that kind of stuff 
so the T positive Sonorans would be great for my stuff, but I'm not willing to risk my citizenship um, mm. or uh, my collection for the sake of a snake. So, it, so that's why I went head first into it to get legal paperwork. I even had a student who I taught formerly in Tulsa, whose father works in Mexico for the government. And he, even he was trying to, to work to get paperwork pushed through for me and to no avail. There was a lot of people wanting money, um, oh. uh, but it was there was no, um, there was no way, and, and there was no guarantee that even with that, you were going to get the, the the paperwork. So, how many Sonoran boas, like in quotes, that were pure? Do you think were exported? Because a bunch were, went to Europe, oh. and a bunch yep. went here, and then we ruined them here by like making mutts with them. Yeah. Like, how many do you think were exported? Isn't that like a larger founder? I think it's a larger founder group. Yeah, I think it's a larger group. Um, my my Sonoran anarchistics are from the European um, export. Um, the hypos, even, we don't know for sure that leopards are even Sonoran. That's where they were said to be from. The lineage is said to be from Sonora, mm. but there's no actual proof that they are definitely um, Sonoran. But you know, they 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 have the kind of some of the phenotypic markers that we would expect from Sonora. Um, but it, it's a, it's a larger pool. The problem, of course, was that we then inbred the hell out of them. You know, like years ago. Uh, whenever I moved to the U.S. 18 years ago, I went up to um, Peter Cowell's facility mm -hmm. and he had bought a bunch of leopards from Hans Winter. And my Sonorans were all five feet, kind of would eat large rats kind of thing. His were the size of Colombian boas and thicker than my thigh. They were clearly just fed massive amounts, but then they all started regurgitating and, and then they all died. But I, I think that was more of a captive care thing. Mm -hmm. um, and probably some inbreeding, but um, uh, I think the bloodlines for Sonoran are, are much bigger. Um, the hypo Sonorans, we don't really know exactly where they were collected in Sonora. We just know that they were confiscated at the border. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we don't know exactly where in Sonora or that range they're actually from. So they are Sigma. We refer to them as Sonoran boas, but, you know. Right. Like, I... Like I, I mean, people have been yelled at me for it, but I'm like, if you needed to outcross to our Hamar, you could keep it within the species, and that would yeah, be who's done not, that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's commonly been done. There was a breeder on the west coast. Um, I think Eric Kreider did that. Um, with um, he would breed leopards into Tara Hamara, and they would just make ones that had slightly more orange or red bellies, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I they, think. Uh, yeah. And that's fine. Know. I've got no issue with that. You're still producing right. a Mexican Sigma leopard, right? Yeah, I have like straight up mutt boas that I think are also fine mm -hmm. and have their mm -hmm. place too. Yeah. I just, I'm just, I sort of like fuss on the internet about like inbreeding depression in these like rare localities because I'm like, if we're saving them for not, then what are we saving them for? I don't know. But I think that's one of the biggest concerns with conservation in general. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't increase diversity, then what do we do? And and part of the thought is that you outcross. It's right. been done with it's been done with dog breeds, right? So right. you'll find ladies where they'll outcross to the, you know, the closest kind of suitable um, uh, lineage, um, and then they will then back cross from there to eliminate traits that were detrimental. And I think you can definitely do that. Like I, the problem is that if you outbreed, well. We don't know exactly where in Sonora they were collected. So for God's right. sake, leopards, <laughs> anarchistic, hypers could all have been collected in, you know, the Tarahumara region. You know, they could all be that anyway. Right, so, right. Uh, yeah, I think we're all maybe thinking about it too much, uh, too deeply considering we don't. Isn't that what the internet's for though? Maybe. Yes, absolutely. It's you all know, for speculation. Like all for, navel you know, gazing and threat yeah, about exactly. stuff that literally doesn't actually matter. Um, yeah, that's why, that's why I just stopped even going into those kind of Facebook groups and, and even thinking about that. Like I, a couple of years ago, I was really invested in a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And then I just stopped looking at it, you know, mm -hmm. in general, like, like people try to friend me on, on Facebook all the time that are related to snake stuff. And I'm like, you're not going to find any snakes on my Facebook page. Very right. rarely. It's family and music and crap like that there, you know? So um, if you want to see snakes and go to my, my Instagram page, that's kind of thing, you know, but uh, I just stopped looking at it because it just became people arguing and, um, and a lot of just like, what is my snake? And you're like, oh, what did you buy it as? Well, I bought it as a Central American. Well, that's what you got. Right. You know? Yeah. All right. I think 
I, I yeah, I don't want people to make stuff up, but I think since lots of things are made up as it is, it's okay to be like undocumented suspected CA. Could be yeah. anything. And that's what I said. Yeah, like there's certain right. things we can identify, right? If it's het leopard, you can see that it's het leopard, mm -hmm. right? But you don't know that it's a Sonoran het leopard or a Sigma het leopard. It could be just a Central American het leopard. That's it. Right. Right. That right. kind of thing. So, and I've got no problem. I think that's a great way to, to sell stuff, you know? And for most people that are keeping these, they're not interested in localities. They're interested in just, just like ball pythons, putting one thing on top of the next thing and so on. And you're always going to have those people that are really into lineages and localities and they will have their pure lines pure lines but yeah do you think boas will ever get or deserve a registry uh i don't think like so. a dog dog breed registry yeah, are we I just too so, like I, I was approached about that yeah, i was approached about that um i don't think i went when it was maybe it was 2013 or 2014 and somebody wanted me to sign a non-disclosure agreement to talk about the whole thing and i was like i'm not doing that there yeah what you know? <laughs> So again, you want me to do all the testing and you want me to ask, no, that's not going to work. Um, the reason being is that until we have all of the localities from the wild um, represented in, in a sufficient sample size where we can say, yes, this is this is, or this is that, there's no point having a registry. At least with dogs, for example, you've got long-term lineages that we can follow back, mm -hmm. right? So a friend of mine breeds Irish wolfhounds and you know, he's got 10 or 11 Irish wolfhounds. And for all of them, we can trace back lineage after lineage after lineage pretty far back. Mm -hmm. It's hard for people to do that here in, in the kind of the reptile hobby. Yeah, I can look at my animals and say, right, I know who produced the great, great grandfather of this year. And I know the lineage from it, but not a lot of people have that. Right. And, and, and along the way, things get mistaken by some people. And I just don't think it's, I don't think it's worth it. I don't see the so, point. Who's going to, who's going to maintain it? And who's going to uh, do all the It would have to be to like a, a non-profit organization interested in the yeah. propagation of captive boas. I mean, like I, I had registered goats. So we had two books. Yeah. We had a purebred book and we had an mm -hmm. open American book. So you could actually yeah. breed a pure buck to mm -hmm. whatever was floating around mm -hmm. goat wise enough generations. And it could get enrolled by percentage of Nubian into the American right. books. Okay. Te technically we could do that. I'm not saying that's like a replacement for the wild animal. But mm -hmm. you could have a known pure book and a known percent. Yeah, but book. again, again, you the known pure is difficult because it's known pure by. <laughs> well, by we two. just need like, to pay a bunch of grad students to run around in cartel yeah, country and not yeah, get shot. See, I don't think that works. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but also, then when you, the problem you got is also exporting um, yes. genetic material. So that's also a real problem from. I mean, could you sequence it in Mexico? Countries. You can email. You could, yeah. Loads. You could sequence right. it in Mexico, and then you could um, just upload the the data to the cloud. But that means you need to have a collaborator with access to an Illumina sequencer in the lab, and, and the, mm -hmm. you know, and have the money. You know, for me to for me to do a run on a NovaSeq Illumina, it's about I think here it's about thirty eight hundred dollars, thirty four thousand dollars, something like that there. Um, and depending on the number of samples, I want if I'm doing whole genome, that's probably yeah, for that, it's probably about 150 samples I can get away with, mm -hmm. but not everybody has access to that kind of funding. Mm -hmm. And that's just that's just the sequencing. That's not the library prep and everything else that goes with it for the DNA. But not everybody has access to that, and not all facilities have that available to you wherever you go. Because I've looked at that for other systems before mm -hmm. um, about you know doing work in Europe and sequencing there and making it easier. But it's just it's it's just there's always it's fraught with difficulties. It's, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. No, like if you look at our 2014 paper, 2015, whenever that came out, there's a really good sample size in it. And a lot of those are sampled from museum specimens and samples that were The phylogeographic and population one? Yeah, Darren Card's paper. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's a, a great paper. My I have a quick question. Quick question. Yeah. Did you have Longicata in, or no. in, okay, because it's like, it looks like there's no, and like no. a perder intrusion down the west coast of the Andes, and I'm like, if you look at them, they're they are weird. Yeah, yeah. So we will do the well. I will do those at some point. I've also okay. got I've also got shed skins from Nebulosa and Arophius, um, and a bunch of other things. Is that, Nebulosa uh, still in the hobby? No. Uh, okay. Yes. I mean, in Europe, I because they had those problems I know, I know with of, like I know of I know of some in the U. Yeah, I know of some in the U.S. 
Um, oh, some in the U.S. I, That's cool. Yeah, there's, I don't. I'm not aware of any Arufius in the U.S. Um, and the ones in Europe that I'm aware of, the Nebulosa and the Arufius, all came down with IBD. I think it was. I think it was IBD. Mm -hmm. and kind of knocked them out. Um, really cool snakes, you know. Like I, I had a friend back in England um, who sadly passed away about I don't know 18 years ago. He had Nebulosa and he had Arophius, and they were the funny thing was the the Arophius were really beautiful. The Nebulosa were horrible. Um, I like and Nebulosa. I, They're weird. Oh, I love like... them. Not yeah, it's fantastic. I love them. Yeah. And I've I've been working on a project to try and bring them in from the island again. Uh, okay, to bring, in, cool. to bring in ten animals, the same thing as the, the, the same way as we did with the Trinidad Russian burger mm -hmm. So I'm using that as a as a as a model to then take to um, Saint Lucia and to Dominica to try and bring in a, a some animals specifically for scientific research. Do you have to I don't know opt in a zoo and be like some of them will be at the zoo? Wink no. and some okay no All right. no but 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 with like with our Trinidad that the offspring for that go to um, zoological institutions for okay. the first generation. The That's second good. Generation, I like that. Second generation I'm, I'm we can sell. <laughs> yeah, and we generate a stud book from it. Um, so we know the genetic diversity good. within the original finding group good. and the ind individuals that were crossed and so on. I think um, that that's good. Like, we've yeah. messed up so much stuff in the hobby as hobbyists. You know, I don't know. It'd be nice to have yeah. something Sorry, nice that's... from the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, sadly, but so, sometimes that's been intentional. Sometimes it's been unintentional. Mm -hmm. You know, a great example of the unintentional are the um, the Fiji Island iguanas. Fiji mm -hmm. Island iguanas were thought to be like one lineage, one species, and the zoos were crossing them and breeding them, and it turned out they they were multiple species. So Dang it, it kind of screws things up, you know. But right. and that was that that was before really that you had access to a lot of the molecular tools that we have now to be able to determine lineage and species. Um, so I think, but there has definitely been a whole bunch of deliberate crosses that are done. Like I, well, the funny thing is whenever I bred, uh, whenever I first crossed leopards into the Costa Rican T-positive line, they were mm -hmm. both in Parader. And right. a year later, I was part of the group that changed that. <laughs> so all of a sudden I had hybrids. Do people um, get, some people get very, I don't know, antagonistic about stuff like that. And you're like, but I, but they used to be all the same, so it was, yeah, it's a, you know. Yeah, yeah people, people get antagonistic about it because and they don't even understand what they're talking about. Okay. It's just they use, they hear other ones with buzzwords and they think that's the way to do it, you know. So, um, you know, does it change how we keep these animals? No, it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. Are these animals going to be released into the wild? No, they're not. You know, they're right. not going to be brought back to Mexico or Costa Rica or anything, you know. So um, just enjoy them for what they are, you know. That's my very opinion. good policy so that's I mean, why, a lot of people that's, like that's get really mad and i'm yeah, like, like i have my i have my sigma lineages and i've got my imperator lineages and um i only keep costa rican imperator enough maybe i've got no 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 hold on i've got the freaking island ones. island ones yeah but i'm not cre they're not being bred into anything else they're there's project specific um but you know i've also got the sigma imperator crosses but they're represented as, as such nobody's going to look at a Costa Rican T positive hypo leopard and say that that's hopefully uh, you know right but but then again I have anarthristic leopards that are pure sigma and I'm working mm -hmm. on anarthristic hypomelanistic leopards that are pure sigma right but at least I can still represent them I, I can say these are pure sigma yeah that's good yeah. I think people mm -hmm. will believe you too so that's good I hope so <laughs> <laughs> do you so like I watch uh, in the paper there. Ta you talked about like you know different alleles for um, insulin like growth factor being sort of diminished, and like the concentration of that in certain island species and other growth genes. Do you think some of there's also like epigenetics changes that aren't actually like fixing alleles that would also contribute to small size in island boas that would maybe like roll back once they're in know. captivity and like yeah well i think that's a good given more food we look, at, we look at hog islands and they're a great example of that right hog islands on the island are size restricted because of the food that's available to them mm -hmm. but you bring them off the islands and then they can grow to six feet seven feet right, right? and i've talked to you know some um some friends that work on on have worked on the boas on the islands 
and they've said that every so often they'll find like a six or seven foot female but it'll be the thickness of a broomstick just because the food's not there to be able to maintain mm -hmm. its size and they'll they'll obviously, obviously dwindle away and die um but they seem to reach the three and a half four feet and that seems to be where they peak out on the island but that's a diet restricted thing i, I i'm curious about the smaller boas on islands we certainly see the cocker cay and the crawl cay and stuff getting it bigger than what we would expect them to be on the island but that's because on those islands they are very food restricted very diet restricted to a very short period of time where they mm -hmm. gorge and then they fast for a very long period of time if we were if we replicated that in captivity we would see our animals staying smaller size vin Reese is a great example of that because right. that's what he does um, and that's why he's got you know he'll post pictures of of hog island boas that would sit in the palm of his hand kind of thing when you're gravid um so i think there are some factors that are associated with it totally environmental there's a lot that are that are environmentally driven and there will be some that are genetically um uh, controlled that are you know could be related to size and so on right i i think the hard part has been like does feeding them like they would eat on the mainland break them or does it restore the genetic potential of what they could have been on the mainland i'm not saying like overfeed but it instead of like that mm. seasonal feeding like is a six mm. foot hog island ruined or if it was yeah, I don't think six years to get there and it yeah you know no, was still fed ruined. with lots of breaks and fasting yeah, periods I, is I it feed broken mine, you know I, I i've got hog islands that are you know, probably five and a half feet and eat jumbo rats but they'll eat one once a month and they'll eat seven of those a year right and then right. they last from november through to through to march um and i wouldn't consider them broken um, right right i i wouldn't either but there's some people have been like if your hog island is bigger than x it's a hybrid or, or like you know yeah, a locality also, cross and i'm like there's also maybe. a lot of people that will say that there are no pure hog islands in in the u.s and that's nonsense <laughs> You know, you can tell just by looking at a snake whether it's a pure hog island or not. It's very easy. Yes, there's a lot of crosses, mm -hmm. but but there are, in my opinion, there are many more pure hog islands than people think. Okay. You know? Good. All right. Purple Church has a question. Can you talk about the origin of the type two anery gene in Sigma and how that came about? I can. I bought a group of animals with a friend from Europe in 2000, probably 2000. And they came in through um, an importer called Clive Osborne, the guy that I mentioned earlier that had the nebulosa and the rotates. He had a very large um, locality collection of boas um, in the UK and in London. He sadly passed away from cancer in 2006, 2000, yeah, 2000, 2005. Um, and at this point in time, I was mainly keeping emerald tree boas and Amazon tree boas. Had a pair of ball pythons and stuff like that there, but I didn't want something that was that was big and my friend who he and I brought these animals in together. Um, he had some Colombian boas that were like eight feet, enormous big beast. And I, I just thought I, I don't want that. So Clive told us about the small desert boa and he could get six of them and it was 2.4. So we got those. I kept the largest pair and they were both probably about four feet. Uh, my friend uh, kept a couple, one of them passed away one of them died. It just didn't, it just failed to thrive, and we might have sold the pair. Um, but um, I got them, and and they were dark boas. They were small, fed great, but I just didn't think much of them. And I put them into a four foot by two foot enclosure. It was when I lived back in Belfast. They were on the ground floor, or they were on the, the on the floor level of the room. It was a small box room, and on one side were all my corrales. And then a bunch of baby racks and then this two foot by four foot by two foot by two foot enclosure on the bottom i didn't realize that it was around november that the power must have gone out that the ceramic heater on that must have blown and it wasn't heating them um but underneath that floor was leading to a radiator in the uk you've got wall mounted radiators that are you know yeah. hot water generated and it was right sitting above the hot water heat uh, line so it was getting some heat um at the same time i was building two four by two by two enclosures for each of those snakes in a different room and i think in january or february i brought them in and put them into those separate enclosures and i just you know went back to not thinking about them much feeding them and that was it and one night i was working on one of my phd chapters it was 2002 and i turned around and i saw the female was giving birth and she Surprise. popped out a baby 
she, she, yeah, I didn't even know she was gravid. She popped out a baby that was stillborn and it was gray, black and white. I just thought, well, you know, sometimes with early kind of premature stuff, they can they can have those kind of color issues. She produced, I think, I think maybe 12 or 13 babies in total. I need to look at my records. But there was one other baby that was gray, black and white. It was alive. It was a female. So I kept that and I sold the rest. And a year later, I um, bred them again. And she produced four more anathristics and a bunch of possible hats, which I sold. And I then traded some of those anathristics in Europe with other people for albinos and stuff like that there. So it was 2002 was the first. I've got a picture of it somewhere I can send you. Um, but it was a great snake. And that lineage is wonderful because they're very similar to the black-eyed anathristic, mm -hmm. but they don't have black eyes. So they're they're small. Um, they you know, The black-eyed anathristic line can get really big. These here are the standard size for Sonorans, but they're jet black, uh, white, and gray. There's no browning out on them. And awesome. their eyes are silvery. They start off lighter in color, which is really interesting. Whenever you produce them, they start out light. And over the space of two years, they get darker and darker and darker. Do they get black tail status? Yeah, really jet, really jet black. Yes. Um, so I, um, I saw so this 2002. I first produced them. Um, what else happened then? So I then moved to the U.S. in 2005, 2006, January 1st, 2006. And I brought one with me. Uh, the original female and i didn't do much with it i didn't really didn't really no i brought two i brought a pair i didn't really do much with them i just kind of did their stuff that female ended up dying while gravid which sucked and then i didn't really think much more about the project i was producing things here and there and it was only a couple of years ago that i really got back into it and decided i should really do something with this here Mm -hmm. So we've produced a lot of different things. You know, we've got anarthristic leopards, we've got anarthristics, we've got hypo anarthristics, that kind of thing. Um, and we're busy. We should have hopefully two litters this year with them. But I've only sold a handful in the U.S. I think I could count on on two hands the number of anarthristics that I've sold in the U.S. over the last couple of years. You should make some more. We need them. Like they are. We got. I've got um, two females being bred by. Um, anathristic lepers at the moment. How did your collection do with the move? Were they a little bit confused or? Which one? The one from Belfast to the US? Or, oh, no. or, or, I'm or sure just... that one did a lot, but like from <laughs> Tulsa to. Yeah, it's funny. I, well, think about it. I did it twice, right? I did it from Raleigh to Tulsa. Mm -hmm. At that point I had a hundred and something animals, including several that were gravid. And I did that over four days and, and that was fine. I lost no animals and gravid females gave birth later on and everything was fine. This one coming here was different because um, we weren't just moving straight away. I was, um, I spent between January and, Ju and July, I was driving back and forth between Tulsa and Blacksburg every two weeks. Mm -hmm. so I was spending two weeks in Tulsa and then two weeks in Blacksburg. At the same time, we're getting ready to sell our house. And the last thing you want in this beautiful 100 year old home in Midtown Tulsa, the last thing you want is to go into the basement and find 120 something snakes. <laughs> If you're well, I, I wouldn't. I would, I would, I would be, be fine with it. I think everyone. But for most buyers, I've heard that that is frowned upon. <laughs> right. Exactly. So thankfully, I moved my animals to my friend in Knoxville, mm -hmm. and he's a friend of mine that probably one of my best friends. I've known him since we met in Belfast thirty years ago. So, um, and we just ended up being several hours apart in the U.S., which is kind of weird. He's from from the U.K., and um, so he also keeps snakes. In fact, I've I've got a number of animals that I've sent him on long-term breeding loans my womas and my darwin carpets and all that kind of stuff and some like the leucistic bows stuff i've sent him all of those just to play with but he then housed most of my all of my collection and they all did fine but what was happening was that we weren't feeding them really because i didn't want to turn around to to jonathan and say um by the way could you feed these every two weeks as well and clean up after them right so for six months they were on a real minimal they might have been fed twice three times the young ones were fed more often but the, the anything that was two years old or, or above got fed maybe two or three times in six months and um and it's funny because i did not intensely put animals together while i was you know there and when i would defecated and i would move things around and but i always moved them around to things that i would move them to if i was breeding them and i ended up still producing four or five litters last year, which was kind of crazy. I lost Good. three animals, um, but they were all age related, I believe. It was an, an emerald, a male emerald tree boa, 
um, who was 20, 22 years old. Um, yeah. and every year he would, he was a great breeder, but every year he would go into this fasting phase and it would really be hard to kick him out of it in the last three years. But um, this time he just didn't want to come out of it. Um, and then there was a, a leopard that I produced 18 years ago and she had produced like six or seven litters in her days and she had started to show this decline, not feeding very well, even before the move. And then um, another animal, I forgot what the other one was, but um, so those three that were kind of age related, everything else, you know, we moved it. As soon as I, we got settled here, I got the, the room in, in the basement that I'm using at the moment set up, drove down to Knoxville, which is three hours away and loaded everything into a U-Haul and brought them back. And, um, and at that point, I put them into a full on massive feeding phase. Mm. And I was feeding them every seven days and, um, you know, they regained any lost weight very rapidly. And uh, my bank, bank balance depleted very rapidly as well as from buying all of those rats. Mm -hmm. um, but everything's been great. Yeah, everything's, you know, this year it's it's crazy. I've got, you know, I, I've got a lot of animals paired. I've got multiple that have gone through post-ovulation sheds and multiple that are paired uh, and still breeding. So it's, we're probably going to have a pretty decent um, year of production, you know. Yeah, while you were in Knoxville, you bought, you sold Shane. I did. Snakes. Yeah, we, we met, uh, we met at like Six five thirty in the morning. Yeah, the, he's like the, the my, an Irish guy and a bunch of wolf hounds come out of the mist. <laughs> that's exactly what it was. <laughs> and I, I walk, I walked down. My friend's got this massive driveway, and I walked down to the end of it with these ten wolf hounds wandering around me with this little snake in my hand. And and uh, yeah, that was funny. Yeah, Shane's yeah. a great guy. I like him a lot. So yeah, yeah he, he got a, a leopard. I think it was a, a I can't remember if it was a male or a female, but he got a leopard from it. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, but yeah, but very slowly getting into boas. So we're tricking him into it. Uh, That's good. He just starts needs a cell. Just get rid of a lot of those those ball, ball pythons. pythons. And into boas, you know. So it'd be yeah. easier to sleep at night, you know. Well, the nice thing about boas is they're harder to breed as well. You know, like right. ball pythons, you can put the two of them into a wet paper sack, and they'll breed <laughs> at any time of the year, and you'll get eggs. Right? Yeah, they're, they're like teenagers. Right. You know, right. with with them. Um, with with boas it's a little bit more work and there's you know you're you're unlikely to get a hundred percent you know um, right you that's know, like a pairing to, to production so i have a gosh it's probably 10 or 11 pure sigma female hat leopard i mean mm -hmm. let me air quote that pure i yeah. bought her that way but i don't technically know i didn't collect her from the woods mm -hmm. and i can barely get her to ovulate should i should i just like put her outside in like 50 yeah, degree cold. weather yeah so one of the big things with sigma that i find is that i need i drop them down to about 70 degrees in the winter mm -hmm. um i did actually with all of my all of my boas but the sigma really take advantage of it so once i it's you know so it's interesting this year because i've moved from a hundred year old home that had a basement that dropped down into 60 degrees mm -hmm. from november through to february and i never adjusted the heat in those in, in those enclosures but the cool end would always drop down to 70 or thereabouts because of just the just the, the gradient. The females would and the males would just move to that cool end. They, mm -hmm. Even though there was a hot spot still available, they would just stay and they would sit at that cool end. You tempt them and they're sitting at 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. And they sit there for three or four months. Obviously, I'm not feeding them at that point. Um, when I was in Tal when I was in Raleigh, um, they were in a room that was sitting at, at 75 or some 72 or something because it was an upstairs room that we didn't use so the air conditioning wasn't really running in it it was harder to get them to breathe at that point because i don't think they got low enough the, mm -hmm. the sonora region gets cold at night um and i think that's what we need to simulate um here it's a bit different as well because i'm now in this you know relatively high-tech brand new home that's ultra insulated and so it's been a bit more work to get them cooler but i think i think i got them down to 70 or at least close to it Okay. Uh, maybe I mean, I can move her so like in the house, like the stake building. Yeah. I don't know. It's just I think it's just too hot. Like the the year I got her to go, and she just had two babies and some slugs. Bunch of slugs, yeah. So that that's just a that, temperature related thing for yeah. the female and or the male. I just like I gave her no heat at night, and then I plugged it in during the day. But then yeah. and then I paired her once she came out of that after that three month fast and i haven't even bothered since then because it's almost too hard to it's not too hard in my system mm -hmm. i need a like, special zone for yeah so 
what what I do with my Sonoran stuff is I keep them closer to the ground. I don't use fans in my room to circulate heat. I don't use a, I don't use a room heater. I, everything's on. Um, they're either in Freedom Breeder kind of racks or the arboreals are all in arboreal enclosures, but they all have separate heat for their systems. They're not on a on an ambient room, um, so therefore there's no fan circulating air in my room. So it will stratify. You know, the closer to the ground is going to be colder, and I keep the Sonoran stuff on the ground levels, and they will get colder. Um, and so my, my friend, um, Mike Robinette in, in, in North Carolina, um, he has been getting into Sonora bow as well. And, and he, I talked to him about that as well, about getting them colder. It seems to be the key for me, at least. It might not be for everybody, but for mine, getting them at or close to 70, but having access to a hot spot, I find pretty important. Even at and night? I, so I, yeah. So I, I, um, I drop mine... Uh, so an ambient normally is about 84, 83, 84 with a hot spot, and then I'll drop them down. Um, you know, the room just naturally gets colder. Now, this time, I've had to set the thermostat to kind of ramp down to the kind of 70s and uh, to be able to let, let them do that. But it, but it seems to, we'll, we'll see. I've got, the Sonorans are still breeding. My Sonorans would always breed later. They'd obviously normally ovulate from March through to June. Um, everything else kind of ovulates a little bit earlier. So the Sonorans are still breeding pretty heavily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like if you look at nighttime drops where they're from, it can be in the fifties yeah, in the winter. Absolutely. It does warm oh, yeah. up every day, pretty much. Yeah. But yeah, they can, they can they can definitely cope with it. You know, yeah. I've yeah, I've got no. I think Sonorans are the uh, probably the most robust of the of the kind of the boa group. I think Argentines are probably the same. They'll get pretty cold in Argentina. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the Sigma Imperator kind of groups, I think Sonorans are the ones that will will tolerate the greatest temperature. Uh, range do you think that they're like i don't know like diamonds or bolens or something where like maybe uv light is more important than we think it is to I never use it never use I, um, I use i use a little bit with my arboreal stuff and i don't see a difference okay i've, I've never used it with my with the imperator or sigma um they've always been well when I was younger, like 30, 30 something, close to 30 years ago, I used to keep them in, in kind of melamine enclosures um, and they had lights, but they, at that point they weren't UV lights. Um, mm-hmm. Anything that I've had with a UV light recently, like just as a, I had some in my last office and there was a UV light in with those and I didn't notice any, any behavioral change or any, mm-hmm. and I didn't, and I bred them there, I didn't notice anything really different. Yeah, it, I mean the UV police are probably in the in the chat <laughs> right now, but That's sometimes there probably is a difference, and sometimes there probably isn't. It just depends on the species. But mm-hmm. animals that are cold or cold tolerant, maybe they might depend on it more or something. But I just wondered yeah, if you noticed a yeah, trend. I, in my years of breeding Sonorans, and I've probably produced 30, 35 litters. I've only ever had one litter that had that was slugs, and it was my fault for removing the male before she ovulated. Mm-hmm. Um, males boas are terrible at storing sperm, so therefore trying to breed one male to multiple females rarely works very well. Mm-hmm. And removing a male before the female ovulates rarely results in in success. I did that um, this year. <laughs> I yeah, messed. And, I didn't even think she was going. I didn't ultrasound her yeah. or whatever or do anything. And the females like, will swell. And it makes them look like they've ovulated, but it's a pre-ovulation. Spot. No, it's a trap. So Every time until mine until mine goes into that um, post-ovulation shed, um, then I uh, and and starts basking. Then I don't remove the male. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think UV for something. You know, if you use it, cool. Remember, that you can also you can there can be UV toxicity. Mm-hmm. Um, so be careful. Um, as I say, I've got it in with my. Um, some of my emerald tree boas, just because I've got live plants in there as well. And, you know, and I don't see a difference. I don't see them basking any differently. I don't see them behaving any differently. And I don't see them breeding any differently. All right. So, you heard it here yeah. first, everybody. Uh, all right. Purple Church asked, do you know if a pure Sonoran leopard ghost exists yet? It does. Do you have it? I can't say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Check Instagram. Maybe maybe for a they'll be maybe later. maybe I'll maybe they'll be posts. Um, yeah, near, not too near. No, that not sounds too, not too distant future. 
Obviously, it would be called a snow leopard. Please call it that. No, it'll just be called no, a ghost leopard. Hypo yeah. leopard. I'm not one for um. I'm not one for the names. I for was funny names. One with that recently. Yeah, I can't do it. Um, yeah, sure? I, see, I've, I've, I've hoarded a lot of things. I produced a lot of double hats and triple hats and bred them back and hoarded a lot of things over the years that um, I just don't have the time to post a lot of stuff. Um, and I kind of do it very strategically whenever I've got is, projects that I'm wanting to move or push. Isn't that what like TAs are for, like undergrads or whatever? Not for me, but that's not what we do in my lab. My I know, you just trick them into it. Just be like, I have social media at the time. Take a picture of the nah. snake, upload it. No, nah, because we, we don't do they, Most of my students don't even know that I do anything with snakes. Oh, I feel like when I TA'd, I did the worst stuff. Like, I had to go through and find all the, like, you know how there's, like, fetal remains in every lab somewhere that people oh, yeah. lost yeah. the paperwork for, and they're like... Yeah. And so they'll get shunted from lab to lab. They're like, figure out where this fetus goes. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. This is I'm not qualified to find this fetus at home. And then realize here, I, I haven't taught. I, I don't know when I'll be teaching. Maybe maybe next year I'll teach a course. But okay. I went from teaching six courses a year in Tulsa to teaching one every year, maybe two. Is that the best? One every two years. That's awesome. Yeah, it's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Who do you hate yeah, more, I, grad students or undergrads? I don't hate any of them. They're all really beneficial. My lab you wouldn't be what it is. You can make fun of them. This is your it. chance to just make fun no, of anything. My lab would not be what it is without without undergrads. I've had undergrads that have generated preliminary data that's resulted in six hundred thousand dollar grants, and I've had grad students that have generated data that's resulted in really kind of really media impacting papers. So I I, I see love them. As being really I love important. that. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Um. Let's look at my little notes. Okay, weird question, but I read this paper that you were on and I was like, hmm, the maternal attendance and kin discrimination in pit vipers. Do you <laughs> think boas could do, do this too? With, could Can they recognize? I don't know. If, if left question. for a while in like a litter, they smell each other, like sisters recognize each other or mother offspring recognize each other yeah i don't know anybody doing it um i don't see why not um but we also don't see kind of the group denning behavior mm -hmm. and aggregation behavior in boas and pythons that we do in pit vipers yeah. you know so we can go out like i've got samples that i'm playing with now that are crotalus viridis that we're sequencing for a grad student, not in my lab, but I'm just doing it to help out. And we're going to be looking at relatedness and lineage kind of aspects. Um, because, you know, my friend Emily Taylor has posted a bunch of pictures over the years of really cool pit vipers that are all sitting beside each other and doing their thing. And we know from those, there's a lot of them where we can trace them back to being siblings, mm -hmm. half siblings and so on. Um, with boas, we just don't see that aggregation of animals to my knowledge. You see some aggregation when it comes to breeding season where you get multiple males trying to breed a female just like you do with anacondas mm -hmm. but then they tend to disperse you know so it's um the question is are those males related in any way or are they totally unrelated just randomly coming right together? are they brothers teaming up tag teaming yeah so yeah at least it brought up any, the carpet question related. which is sort of where this is going like there's a paper that like the with in python natal incest where they were doing I don't know. There was clearly like not just nesting behavior, but also mm -hmm. like maternal attendance, and they were mm -hmm. thinking about each other. So it's obviously in the in the wheelhouse potentially. And if the carpets yeah. are like potentially choosing nest sites together, they could actually be sisters or. So what are they? Yeah. So boas and pythons are what, maybe about fifty million years separated, right? <laughs> That's not that much. <laughs> That's pretty far. <laughs> well, and then there was a paper. It was like all of the instances of maternal attendance in all squamates it's like a big beta analysis and it's usually like skinks because they're ovovipers and they yeah. pair up and, and, and take care of yeah. their babies yeah, yeah that paper and i was like D do boas do that I and mean, maybe they don't maybe they do disperse but do they recognize each other when so they see I, each so other? i'm not i'm not aware of any papers that look at boas breeding in the wild other than you know these right a little herp review notes that have come along and said we find them three males and one female i don't you know and we see if you go onto that um i naturalist you'll see pictures of gravid boas frequently 
mm-hmm. but it's individual animals. So we don't know what we can see is whenever there's gravid pit vipers, there's a bunch of gravid pit vipers all, all around the same mm-hmm. place, right? With pythons, you often see the same thing, but mm-hmm. we know a decent a bit about Python home ranges because of Rick Shine's work. And we know that they could be overlapping and therefore where they're coming together is just the ideal, it could either be the ideal spot for incubating. So you think there has to be like be, a... Or it could be just a, an ancestral place where that's where they constantly go back to. You see that in Bowling's pythons where nests are being reused mm-hmm. and so on. So there's obviously, you know, we gotta we, we can't think of these as just being dumb animals. There's some, you know, homing behaviors and naturalistic tens, trends to go back to, to certain areas um, where you might see then I think with pythons you're more likely to see group group nesting. I don't with boas, I don't know. And and whether and whether siblings will recognize each other, I don't know either. I think that'll be a it'd be a neat project for someone that wanted to, to develop that. It's gonna be a pain in the ass because um, you know, you've got the whole process of producing the offspring to then go mm-hmm. from there. It's not as if you can just turn around. It's, with corn snakes it's different, right? Right. I can I used to breed so many corn snakes, it was it was vomit inducing. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh I, I love know, corn snakes you, though when, oh so do i think they're great but when you put two together you kind of knew you were getting at least right one you have many replicates sometimes uh, two <laughs> yeah very easy to get with boas it's a bit harder than that right you know so i think the work involved in doing that is more difficult and for the armchair scientists at home i think having the the, the setups required and the replicates required to get any statistically sound data is also a little bit more complex. Yeah. Yeah, it might be cool. like, I don't know, like resource partitioning, like mm-hmm. it, in the carpets, there is only one good spot to have your, to, to right. nest with yeah. your eggs. And so like, yeah. maybe they recognize sisters because they actually interspecifically compete with other females for preferred sites, mm-hmm. but they might mm-hmm. not do that to sisters or mothers, daughters. I don't know. Like that, and I read that Neurodia paper where the <coughs> unrelated Neurodia will cannibalize younger Neurodia. But oh, if they absolutely. notice yeah, that Neuro- it's good. God, they're horrible. Neurodia will eat anything that moves. But they'll resist eating their stuff they're related to. Yeah, offspring. you see that in rodents as well, though. You mm-hmm. see preferential cannibalization of um, of unrelated versus related. Right. Yeah, I, you know, but um, you know, with with pit vipers again, it's it depends on production and. You know, they're often born, I don't know, they, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, in all of the litters mm-hmm. of boas that I produced, they are very rarely for any period of time sitting near each other. And, and here's mm-hmm. the deal. I, most of my litters of boas are born whenever I'm away on vacation and I'm coming back two weeks later, hoping there's no stillborns. <laughs> and right? It's like rotten. Yeah. Um, You're peeling off closures. chunks of dried goo. That's it. In the enclosures, they're everywhere in the enclosure. They're not all yeah. huddled together. And I think if those enclosures were bigger, those would things be would be even gone. further apart. Yeah, yeah it so does I, seem like they bolt. And sometimes the mothers will be waking them up. And even if they're touched, they'll like shake yeah. them off. <laughs> they already yeah. don't want to be touched by them. Right. Yeah. But they'll so, wake them up and be like, go. Yeah. So I would I would think if we're going to see any, you know, maybe iNaturalist will have the odd picture. Maybe Herper View, but Herper View is hard to, to search. Mm-hmm. You might find pictures of, you know, where they've come across females that have just given birth or recently birthed but you know with, with pythons they got to stay at least you know they they're in the egg for a bit after they you know once they kind of crack through the egg then they're still there sitting in it for a while and there's that longer period of time together i i don't know i, I think with bows you're probably less likely to see it but i um it is interesting I think a lot of work to test it i think you could test it but i think it's gonna be a lot of work to test it realistically i mean it would be possible like a tree bow would be more likely to do it or an yeah, anaconda. I don't think something. so. They also run bows. away. Yeah. And the thing is they drop them from the trees. Right? So they're, <laughs> they're not coming. Yeah. So they'll go to the lower branches and drop them, but that's it. They're like, screw you. And uh, so you might find some aggregation for a period of time, but I think they're, they're getting out of there as well. Yeah. yeah. I, it, I, I don't know if they do anything. I just, all of it is very interesting. All of like the reproductive ecology and like potential, you know, uh, gender selection a little bit, like minor biases that could exist, maybe all that we need more. I don't know who's going to pay for any of this no. <laughs> research. Though. That Well, here's the deal. Sorry. All of the parthenogenesis work I've done, I've paid for that. You know, nobody's funding that kind of work. 
right now. You know, so it's uh, and and there's been a bunch of people that I've helped out by doing parent age analysis on animals. I've paid for that there. In the end, you know, they might have given me an animal or something like that there, but I've paid for all of that. So a lot of times I've done it for free. Um, there's an individual now who's trying to find lineage history on the scaleless corns. And, Eric? Um, yeah, and I'm doing genetic testing for that there for free. You know, and that's costing me, realistically, when I think about how much that's going to cost me, that's probably going to cost me several thousand dollars. Do you want a charity auction, brother? No. No, I'm serious. No. We'll know. put a bunch of ball pythons up and sell them. <laughs> we'll get Eric some yeah. for, no, for no, Eric. No, no, no. For, show, uh, Eric. no I, for that, I, you know, I see a real benefit in that their kind of project, you know, so because of the problem it's creating. Gosh. Is he trying to prove that most scaleless corn snakes are such a high percent corn snake that it doesn't matter that there were some MRI in it at some point? Well, he's not trying to. I actually approached him about it a while back when I heard he was. I, I, I've never met him, but whenever I'd, I'd heard either on podcasts or on um, maybe on the, I don't know, somebody sent me a link about the issues that he was having. I thought, well, you know, the the big question for me is: Are the, do we know the actual lineage history of these animals, and mm -hmm. can we prove that they are MRI, or can we prove that they are pure corns, or what? And at that point, you know what. To what percentage does it need to be, to be a, right. to be considered, you know, um, a hybrid still, you know? So, so we're we're trying to get the, the biggest thing is that this really, it, it really depends on getting samples from those early, scaleless animals, right? You know, because corn snakes breed, you know, so easily, so rapidly, in terms of at young ages, we can, we've gone through a lot of generations already. Right, the um, average scaleless right now is pretty far removed from yeah. So we can the lose MRI. Yeah, so if MRI is there, we can lose MRI pretty quickly. The other good thing, however, is that like many zoology professors, things that die in our collections, we keep in the freezer, maybe unintentionally. I think mm -hmm. we're going to dump it at some point. So if you dig down in that rodent freezer, you're probably going to find one of the early scaleless <laughs> corns. Right, right. <laughs> and we can get tissue from those things. So, um, so we're playing with it. You know, literally, I just, I just got this from. No, it's from Ryan Young. Where's the other one? I just got, yeah, from Eric today. Awesome. Shed skin samples. So, and these ones are amethystine pythons for our project from Ryan Young. Yeah, yeah. What happened to Eric is dumb, but Illinois, Illinois is also just dumb because they ban yeah. like Mexican hognose, which is a completely different species because mm -hmm. it just could look like Western hognoses. Right. Right. It's like, so yeah. they're failing. So I, even if it doesn't, they're just, they just will just ban stuff for fun. I don't yeah, know if they whether, be convinced. Ultimately, whether it will help with anything, I don't know. But um, it's, uh, it's for me, it's kind of, it's a curiosity, you know, like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of fascinated by that kind of stuff. Hybridization is kind of interesting in general, but if it, if it can help in any way where we can generate data that is scientifically signed data and say, here you go, this proves that these scaleless corns are, you know, 90 something percent, you know, corn snake and not emery eye, then, you know, realistically, there should be no reason why these can't be kept in, in that area, at least providing data to allow them to then make a judgment from that there. It'll be funny because <laughs> it's probably like part king snake, part corn snake part Isn't rat everything. snake part whatever yeah, I, don't, I don't think yeah i don't think so i think, I think they are i think some yeah, of them are weird i think they're ugly as hell what uh, jungle corns think, oh scaleless yeah, scaleless i think scaleless yeah. animals in general right on <laughs> are pretty awful <laughs> you don't the like the flaccid wrinkly thing with no lips rolling around. no no it's terrible it's just oh God, did you see the scale of sperm? It's like the worst yeah. thing I've ever seen. So I described that to a friend years ago. So I saw the um the first scaleless that was brought to Daytona a whole bunch of years ago. I saw it. And I described it to someone who wasn't there as it looked like my grandmother's old leather sofa. The really, really old one that's like a 60-year-old sofa that's it's all like got all crunchy. the cracks through it. <laughs> it's a crunchy and it's got the cracks, and it's really nasty. And it's so bad. I said it's, I said it's just like that. It looks like you know, in, in the in the winter, you know, your skin cracks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I thought 
it's like that. And I'm sure that's just horrible for those animals. All right, what does it feel that... like? Or what does it feel like to not have heat pits when you're supposed to express heat well, pits? Well, apparently they'd be fine. They just, the females just can't breed, right? They just don't produce. But yeah, it's, um... but, but, listen, if you got to lubricate your snake to keep it going, I don't know. Exactly. And the fact that they share like every 10 days or whatever. And if you're not there and you have to sniff the skin for it to be able to see for me as an evolutionary biologist, that's something that suggests it's not going to do well. Right. So yeah, maybe we should, we should be propagating it. We find albino adults in the wild. We find anarthristics and pies and all these different color morphs. Mm -hmm. We don't find adult scaleless animals in the wild to my, to my knowledge. For some things, it's fine. I, I think for corns and stuff like that, they're they sort of, they they're a, bit, a little bit different. But oh. for the pythons, the the like there's the scaleless. Um, there was a scaleless bolines, right, or a partially scaleless bolines at one point. And yeah, it's, Alex it's, just uh, brought up the scaleless shingleback, which sounds like the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> that looks terrible. Yeah, oh, that's awful. Yeah, I'm I'm strongly anti scaleless even in species where it's fine, like corns and rat snakes or whatever. I just think like uh, what what's too much, right? We can change the color; yeah. that's fine. Yeah, color and pattern is fine with me. Whenever yeah. you remove a part of it that's really pretty important, you know, it's like having a skinless human, you know. <laughs> it's kinda... Right, or like let's breed. Let's get rid of your, let's get rid of your fingernails. Much. Enjoy that, yeah. Especially for animals that have heat pits. Like, can you imagine like a scaleless emerald? Its whole face would be just like gone. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it, it would look differently. Yeah, scaleless sanzania. Or, I, yeah, I like my sanzania with skin and scale. Yeah, yeah me animals, too. Yeah, I'm glad we agree on this one. Yeah, People are like, a lot of... <laughs> you're making a huge mistake not breeding a scaleless. And I'm like, I just like them to look like the animal. Each to their own. Yes, you know? that's fine. If, if you like them, cool, do it. That, that's the other thing. I think people worry too much about other people's opinions. If well, you have to sell says, them, right? So, like, other people's yeah. opinions kind of matter. Well, you, know, you can give them away, you know, you can feed them to king snakes, whatever, right? <laughs> but, all your scales, corn snakes. Right? But, <laughs> you know, true. I think it's funny that people worry about what other people think. You know, yeah, like that, if somebody I, came to me and said, Warren, I am so disgusted by your green Sanzinia, I think you should, I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. I don't care what you think. I love them. Right. right. So, who would say yeah. that, though? Be realistic. Oh, I've, had, I've had people tell me that the green suns in here are ugly. I'm like, yeah, that's Did cool. you slap them? <laughs> oh, What's wrong like, with yeah. you? Get some each, sense. Each, each to their own, you know? <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, but just things like, yeah, I don't know, the scaleless. If scaleless survived fine um, without a lot of additional um, assistance, then mm -hmm. I would be fine with that. But they are at a real disadvantage because you have to be on top of them continually. And there's other systems that we know, but we know going into ring pythons and Brazilian rainbows that you have to be careful with humidity. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is if you get them too humid, you're going to cause scale rot in those things. Look at the uh, scaleless blood pythons, right? So the scaleless blood they're... pythons succumbed with it because they don't shed for three months and they, they, they had scale or skin rot within a couple of days, right? So. Right, and the keratin protects them from yeah. infection. Like that's the whole point, right? Now, how does a scaleless animal do with UV? Do you I know don't, that? Probably not that good. <sighs> In a bioactive <laughs> setup. <laughs> uh, I think I broke the internet. Oh fuck! <laughs> and I, I think there's like definitely a time and a place for bioactive and stuff. But I've been like pretty mm. critical because you'll see like Dark some frogs. happy pet person pull their cow king out of their bioactive that they haven't seen in four weeks and it has like a raging skin fungus infection because mm -hmm. it's not as clean as they think it is it's not perfectly clean i this... watched one of my six foot emerald tree boas today taking a dump shared last night took a dump no cleanup crew in the world is going <laughs> to clean up after that Either the shed skin or the defecate that it removed, that it produced. Right. So therefore, wh while I keep live plants in my enclosures and all that kind of stuff, there is not a single isopod that will ever be released into that, and, ne and never will I think that a bioactive enclosure can be maintained for an animal like that. Dart frogs, yes, some lizards, yeah. totally, but but very few snakes, you know, will will because of the amount of you know urine and defecate they produce will ever be able to be kept truly in a bioactive enclosure. Mm -hmm. So unless you, you can have a room size, you know. Have you experimented with 
rain chambers or any of the other I never needed to. I, I actually okay. thought about that today. Um, so I go in, I've, I've got mist king systems on my, um, on most of my arboreal enclosures. Mm -hmm. um, and for those that are not, I go in and just have a hand pump sprayer that I'll spray maybe two or three times a week. Um, but I don't, I've never needed to because the, the enclosures are big enough. They're, they're pretty active mm -hmm. um, and they move around and, and uh, I've never had a problem where I've needed to soak an animal to get it to defecate or to put it mm -hmm. in any kind of rain chamber. But I know that for some people they need to just, and that could be just local environmental conditions if it's a lot drier. Like it's a lot drier here at the moment, which is what we expect for the time of year. So I'll just miss them a little bit more, but I, I don't feel the need. I know that some emerald keepers like deliberately, specific, before they feed them, they'll take them out and put them in rain chambers. And mm -hmm. I don't, I've never needed to, you know, and all of mine seem to be doing fine, but that's just my setup. Did you, uh, you might not have heard about it, but it was on a podcast recently on the, <laughs> Uh, project herpeticulture ron st pierre was bringing imported emeralds not worming them just so he didn't crash them too quick and just sticking them outside in florida i've, I've never wormed any of my import emeralds okay or my trinidad's or any of my import corrales I've, I've only ever wormed one imported corrales hortelana and that was 20 something years ago because it defecated a tapeworm um but i um i have uh, and I'm sure you can find pictures on my Instagram. I've got, you know, anaconda phase emeralds that have been with me now for three and a half years that are six foot in length, eat adult rats. Um, I, I think whenever you bring them in and you worm them and treat them, as soon as they come in, the stress, the dehydration, and then that just crashes them and you're not going to rec recover them. I've talked to Ron about it a few times and I agree with what he's doing. He's, he's in a position where he can put them outside, get natural rain. Mm -hmm. um, dehydration is the biggest killer in my opinion for emerald tree boas and, and likely a cause that, that triggers regurgitation as well you, know, you don't think it's chlamydia i think that as well i think it can be i think there's multiple different drivers for it but i think dehydration is going to be a major issue that crashes emeralds so whenever i get a wild caught emerald they go into a rubbermaid container mm -hmm. and they live in that for two years and there's mm -hmm. no substrate or there's just a like a, a, a like paper towel. There's an arboreal water bowls, multiple, mm -hmm. and they're sitting at a temperature of 85 degrees. And I spit them away and leave them alone. I don't stress them. I don't look at them for a month or so in terms of feeding them. Um, and I don't stress about them. I'm more concerned about them getting hydrated. Right. And once I go through, once they go through that, then I find it very easy to to, to keep them. It, it's hard because like we obviously don't want to nerf any newly wild caught animals kidneys with no. worming but some mm -hmm. species do need to be wormed because oh absolutely of... right and that can and you can you can tell that within a very within a couple of weeks of getting animals in mm -hmm. like i choose not the only reason i've got wild caught emeralds is because there were specific ones that i wanted mm -hmm. you know these anaconda phase where you don't see a lot of them captive so i knew that i had to get those lineages the trinidad trebo is you're not going to get in captivity we've got the only group in right. probably in the world in captivity um so you've got you've got to get but when the animals are doing well then i also don't want to then turn around and say well you've been doing great you produce multiple litters but i'm going to worm you now i don't see the point in that and also with arboreal animals whenever they defecate they can lose they can shed a lot of parasites that they might have and so on um so i i don't worry about them but you, there's going to be some that that you will need to do that too mm -hmm. um, you'll need to you, but my, my my recommendation is get them in and hydrate them first for a week or two make sure they're really hydrated and then treat them because I think once you've got a dehydrated animal, it's stressed and you just killed a whole bunch of parasites in its body that then have to be broken down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're then increasing your likelihood of sepsis and so on. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's hard <clears throat> because like you can get lung flukes from whatever African imports, just like mm -hmm. snakes can get it. So you, mm -hmm. you don't want to give yourself lung flukes. Like we have African house snake keepers who have that problem. Yeah. So like, yeah, but they also, they're probably like kiss, kissing their snakes and stuff like that. Yeah. Let's not kiss our snakes. And then, and then we were talking about, I, I don't know. Remember I was talking to quirky earlier about uh, pendistomes, like the, the native <laughs> yeah, ones yeah. and the non-native yeah. ones. And I'm like, gross, yeah, gross. but yeah, totally gross. <laughs> super what? gross. But I want to know how a human gets those from their snake. I know, in fact, I don't want to know how a human gets those from their snake. Right, because those ones need the intermediate host of a rat. Hmm. You'd have to eat a rat raw. <laughs> yeah, or a go. rat's well, butthole they've, raw. I don't they've, know. They've lost all their money in the ball python market. <laughs> they can't afford it because they're buying all the rats, and then there's only that's all that's left in the freezer. Yeah. 
<laughs> they resort to terrible things. Uh, well, it's, it's just was funny. Like the stupid, like the Burmese band in Georgia, they're like, well, you know, the African pentastomes are like out competing ours and killing all of our native snakes. So that's why we're banning berms. And I'm like, no berm keeper is taking their berms poop and giving it to rodents to yeah. infect the rodents to then get loose and then go get it into wild Mm -hmm. Like that's not the real reason. It's just because you don't want berms in Georgia, to, you know. And there's just been so many bad studies on Burmese pythons by one group that, you know, it, it's. But unfortunately, it is what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree, you know. That I would I would love for a study to look at parasite load in captive Burmese pythons because that's that's your answer, right? If you find that they're not there, then you're you can be right. pretty much secure. It's just like the genetic study that showed that there's no recent release of Burmese pythons into the Everglades, you know, but yet they still blame kept or, or people releasing their pets. There's right. only one, there's only one area in Florida in the um, north, well, mid in the Everglades, in the northern part of the Everglades to the west that has um, animals that appear to have been captive released and they are labyrinth phase Burmese pythons that you'll catch there. Mm. They're in a small area and they're likely from a pet release. But everything else is, you know, that earlier release, probably catastrophic release. Right. <clears throat> the other thing about like worried about some releases now contributing is like those animals are like deeply naive about everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like they're usually really easy to find again. Yeah. You know, they die pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. If they pet releases don't... were common, you'd see a lot of color morphs and pattern morphs. And we don't mm -hmm. see that. Right, so I and, and I you would and you would find a lot of color morph and pattern morph babies because they find enough eggs and nests that they right. and they dissect those so they should find color and pattern morph and that's whenever you know because there will be breeding within the population and, mm -hmm. and passing genes but they don't find that either so, but they don't want to, you know the pet trade is the best way to to kind of cause a lot of media hype so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You gotta make fun you, of. You have to have a boogeyman, otherwise you don't get funding. Yeah, but you look back on the old like postcards from the Everglades from the '60s and '70s, stuff like that, '80s, and they were finding invasive animals there, but taking pictures with them. Yeah, it is right. wonderful, and then re-release it. <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah, yeah it's fine. All right, speaking of parasites, uh, okay, I hate snake mites, but I also hate bed bugs. So you're my man, because around here. <laughs> Every oh, time I do a reptile show, either the snakes are getting, uh, you know, something, or I'm getting something. Yeah, no thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I, I guess the first thing is the the phoenix strain of fleas. Like people didn't think, you, you know, about them. Like they're fipronil resistant fleas, and they mm -hmm. there was a lot of literature. Like we don't believe you. We just think you're misapplying fipronil. Mm -hmm. And then, well, uh, there's fleas there's a lot of insecticide resistance of fleas and i was mm -hmm. just i just wrote a review paper i can send it to you it's just been published in, in oh, current opinions in breaking science. news uh, but it's it's about the use of genetic tools to study invasion dynamics and insecticide resistance in indoor urban pests and i review mm -hmm. bed bug species german cockroaches cat fleas and human lice and uh we see resistance in all of those right very widespread um, mm -hmm. Fibronil resistance is interesting because it often is partially resistant because if they get highly resistant to fibronil, it often affects the actual health of the insect and they die. They, they mm -hmm. can't survive for really high levels of fibronil resistance. But fibronil resistance can be due to two different mechanisms. One is a target site mutation in a GABA receptor. And so it's a nerve cell receptor, a, a channel in a nerve cell that allows for an impulse to be fired, an action potential to be fired. And there's a mutation in it at a, at a the 302nd amino acid position, it changes it from an, an oh, what does it change it from? It's, um, I can't remember. Um, but there's a there's a simple change that occurs and we see that in German cockroaches, in cat fleas, in head lice and stuff like that. They're in the same mutation, which is really interesting. Um, and that's widespread. Now the problem with all these studies on fleas is they tend to be done on lab colonies. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, trying to find the literature on, you know, where someone's a researcher's gone and worked with vets and said, right, send me examples of fleas. Because I'm sure they're seeing fleas on dogs every day. Mm -hmm. and that would give us a real. So I'm actually starting to work with the vet school here 
at Virginia Tech to and several friends at her vets to get samples in and really start understanding these target site mutations. The other mechanism is detoxif detoxifying enzymes. They can have upregulation of genes mm -hmm. that upregulates the production of enzymes, and those enzymes break down or sequester the um, insecticides like fipronil or pyrethrin, and pyrethroids, that kind of thing. Um, so there's different mechanisms that can drive it. But um, it's, so, so understanding which is which is difficult without using molecular tools. Okay. <laughs> but the point is, <clears throat> they can evolve resistance to fipronil. Oh, very rapidly. Right, yeah. yeah. That bed bugs evolved resistance to to um, DDT within four years. After the first introduction of DDT, <sighs> 1948, it was 1952, they started finding resistant populations. So in like, I, I always go back to ghosts because it's the only species I've ever worked with that has like a functioning animal science. <laughs> culture around it sorry like and i'm sure if i did delicious. horses it would be the same thing and it tastes delicious. Right. <laughs> like we have like anti-helmet regimes like yeah. you, you don't yeah. want to make your barber pole worms resistant to everything in the earth so you right. do you you rotate you do rotational right. grazing do we mm -hmm. do snake people need to start rotating anti-mite uh medicines so that the mites don't become super mites because we already have rumors so, about super mites <laughs> that's a great question and we we actually just started a project um in the last couple of weeks i just initiated one um zach loafman was talking about um uh, i heard him talking about having issues with mites in in one part of their collection at the mm -hmm. at the school like one rack continually and and that could either be just a, a rack issue, you know, where they're hard to treat, you know, because they're getting into cracks and crevices and so on, or it could be a resistance issue. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard in, of permethrin resistance right. being already and Back in Raleigh, before I left Raleigh, uh, like 2011, I heard of uh, a um, reptile rescue that was having a lot of trouble with mites that they couldn't treat with common pyrethroids, uh, permethrins and so on. Um, so that could suggest resistance, which wouldn't surprise me. Um, people that have large collections that have large populations of mites are going to find an increased likelihood that mutations will arise to any kind of issue, but to insecticide resistance is, is a very common one because there's, when there's more individuals, there's more, gen especially because they're part of the genetic, mm -hmm. there's more generations, more individuals, more generations, more likelihood of seeing a mutation within a given generation over time. Um, so we, we, I just talked to Zach about that and said, look, we study insecticide resistance evolution extensively. So I've asked him to collect a bunch of the mites that they have. Um, mm -hmm. I'll then, the plan for here is to sequence the genome of those um, and then look at target site mutations. So we can look at specific regions of the genome and those for different um, resistance associated, target site associated mutations, but also we can maintain them. Theoretically, we should be able to maintain snake mites in the lab using one of our blood feeding systems. Mm -hmm. And we can then do enzyme assays to see if it's enzyme detoxification. So once we get that up and running, this is just proof of concept. Nobody's ever going to fund this work either as well. It's not as if I can go to NSF or <laughs> USDA and say snake we'll mites. On auction, we'll sell ball pythons. And, um, yeah, that we've done dairy auctions before. I think people twelve dollars fifty cents that you got from selling thirty. <laughs> we can still do it. You can <laughs> add those ball pythons together. Um, but what we will want in time will be snake mites from people that have them in their collection. So if they contact me in time, once we get the project up and running, if they contact me, I can send them a sampling kit, mm -hmm. and they just need to brush a bunch of the mites uh, into the vial of ethanol and then ship it to me. Ooh. Be, right, they would be dead um, and we can do that there know, um, just... it's interesting you know in the uk before i left people were treating were preemptively treating their snakes with frontline they're a oh, frontline specifically yeah and um they were injecting with um what was the other one that was, that was used in sheep ivermectin ivermectin yeah they were frequently injecting their snakes with ivermectin um <sighs> And I'm from so what impressed. I know, it, from what I know, it, it, it seemed to prove pretty effective. The best way not to get snake mites is just through preventative. Don't uh, go to reptile shows. Well, if you do, um, you've got to be really careful about how you then bring animals back in or else how you even bring yourself back into your room. No, dude, I have <clears> to go <throat> through my garage. I get naked in my garage. Mm -hmm. I have to like I spray my shoes and anything that can't go in the washer with like DEET. Mm -hmm. And then I all that goes in the washer. The snakes have to stay in the garage, be deconned, 
it's kind of the worst part of my oh yeah year. i i love going to reptile shows but i i tend to only go to maybe one or two a year and that <laughs> tends to be the i try to go to well i went to the tinley october show for the first time in 10 or 11 years because we had a i'm on the board of us arc so we had a board meeting for us arc there mm -hmm. um I, and when I lived in Oklahoma, I went to the Arlington show because it gave me a good chance, a good excuse just to go down and see my friend Bob Ashley and a couple of other friends there. Um, and they always gave me free passes to go into it. So it was always fun. But um, I don't go, I, I don't or rarely go to the local shows uh, just because of the likelihood of bringing something nasty back. And I, I don't want any of that. I've never vended a reptile show, you know, so. It's, it's. <sighs> Like, I obviously test all my snakes on intake for lots of things. And then mm -hmm. I take care of them to the highest ability I can. Mm -hmm. And I retest boas every time they give birth. And then I have to take them to a show next to somebody who does not do that. Mm -hmm. And it's it just feels I've like... Never, I've throwing... never tested any animal in my collection. <sighs> Why not? Never okay. to. Is it yeah, possible? Mine, mine's, been, mine's been a, a largely closed population. A collection okay. for many many years very rarely do i bring animals in and they go through a very long period of quarantine and so people talk about quarantine for a month or six weeks i quarantined for a year to two years i, I was just mm -hmm. literally responding to a, a person earlier on today that asked me about quarantine and emerald tree bows and i said i i don't keep wild caught with captive bread they never see right, indefinite other. quarantine yeah and and if i had to then it would be a, a probably about a two-year quarantine before i would even consider yeah, yeah I, so like the problem is, is like, that's good advice for you, but that's not mm -hmm. a good advice for like a baby person who has zero animals. They don't know which ones to buy. So like, they sort of have to test and yeah. quarantine to some extent, mm -hmm. or buy from collections that are quite old, and have not right. yet had problems. Right. Yeah, but also whenever they bring them in, at least there's some pre preventative you can do, you can spray with, there's a variety of different solutions you can use whether it's that next spray from one of those um like was it like lice or whatever permethrin based pyrethroid based keep them on paper towels that's mm -hmm. white don't put them straight straight into that bioactive enclosure um so i think you can and, and just if you can keep them away from your stuff then do that or even put them in an enclosure that's you can kind of partition off from the rest of your stuff yeah i mean i keep so, like the collection in a different building mm -hmm. than like babies and sh show stock are in their own separate spot because like if they all died right you know and then realize that quarantine means that once you bring a new animal into quarantine you, you could have had an animal in there for 12 months and it's still there and you bring a new animal into it then they all reset right back to zero no, yeah, that's why everybody needs like three to ten quarantines. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like buy a lot of stuff. <laughs> this closet, that yeah. closet. Yeah. It it's hard. It's hard because you have to buy stuff to start, and you can't buy just one at a time. So, like, yeah, I don't yeah, know. You just gotta just be careful with the bedding you use and the animals you buy and who you buy from and their reputation but you know in the end of the day most people have to get mites are going to be able to treat it the problem is the more animals you have the more difficult it is to treat but you can still do it like thankfully i haven't had mites in my collection and i don't know how many i don't know close to a decade or over that that's good um but it's um but they you know if you get them you can, you can generally if you're paying attention to them you'll find them pretty quickly and you can get rid of them pretty quickly right uh lisa asked about next guard which is afloxolaner have you ever heard about that Not sure i need it i need to look at the active ingredients and the um and the uh, the target site for those is it a you know the, the crazy thing about insects is that they can evolve resistance mechanisms that we, like so I, we work a lot on bed bugs not because we like bed bugs but because they're a really interesting study system mm -hmm. they've evolved resistance in multiple different ways their cuticles are thicker or some lines they have thicker cuticles so therefore the the insecticide does not absorb through it Mm -hmm. same rate some of them have behavioral aversion where they will stand up on their legs really on their tiptoes basically <laughs> so that their bodies are not in contact with the surface so therefore they're not getting um, in contact with it oh, you'll have those that have 
targets like mutations in their DNA that changes the protein channel structure and therefore it no longer binds to it. You'll have those that have this upregulation of detoxifying enzymes that will sequester or break down that toxin before it has an effect. Now, the crazy thing is that like we're doing a lot of work on German cockroaches and bed bugs um, for low income housing. Mm -hmm. We find that they have just like ball python morphs. They're stacked on top of each other. Wow! So you'll, have it, you'll have it resistant to cuprinol. <laughs> you'll have it resistant to pyrethrin. Get in the ground floor now of bed bugs. You'll have it. Yeah, you'll have it at the detoxifying enzyme and the target site and behavioral and you know. So it's it's kind of crazy how these um, how these insects <sighs> evolve mechanisms, how rapidly they evolve mechanisms. All right. So what can I spray on my hotel beds Fire. right now? That <laughs> That'll kill all of them, so I don't bring them home. So I, so I don't. I, years ago, whenever I started working on bed bugs, and um, I checked hotel rooms whenever I stayed in them. Just yeah, I do. So I would spend an hour peeling back the mattress and peeling, just checking everything. And then, in, in all the years that I've stayed in lots and lots of hotels, I've never found them. So I what I do now recently. is, oh, that's cool. What I oh, I'll send you vials. This, where were you? Oklahoma City. <laughs> I was been to your reptile show and I didn't see any mites on the snakes, but I woke up Sunday morning and I had one like had taking bug. a blood meal from like my neck and I crushed it and I'm like, no. A bed bug or a mite? Like a like a bed bug. It was too big. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. So um yeah. All I do now with hotel rooms is that you know that little metal rack that people ignore that's in the closet? Mm -hmm. I take that out and I put my bag on that there. And that's it. And if there's so not one of those, crawl just, into your bag. Yeah, yeah. And then if I don't, if there's not one of those, I leave my bag in the in the bathroom. I don't leave things lying around the floor. I, and I'll check the bed. I'll check the corners of the mattresses to see if there's any like blood spots. Because mm -hmm. they, you know, bed yeah, bugs yeah. they'll feed, but they'll defecate very quickly. So you'll see little blood dots on it. And if I see nothing from there, I don't, I don't go any further. You know. You don't tear off all the protective sheets and stuff. I also don't stay in a hotel much, you know, if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to Arlington, I'm in the room for like six hours at the most each day, you know, sleeping and because I'm at partying and doing other, I mean, talking to friends, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and other stuff, Do the bed you know? like to get into your stuff as adult or is it more eggs getting uh, on adult. you? Uh, well, adults. On your clothes. Yeah. Adults. It's and it only adult. takes one, it only takes one pregnant female um, to find a population. So we've had papers in, 2011, I think we had a paper right that showed that an entire nine story building had been infested by a single pregnant female bed bug. They inbreed. Now, if we talk about inbreeding, they're good. The, at average, it. the average relatedness value of bed bugs in populations is about 0.75. So they are past full sieve. They are, they're going towards clonal. <laughs> they're genetically, really genetically to pauper. Yeah, they're crazy. They're going to like, the next level like of being inbred that's you alabama should, uh, specialty right there i don't know if you're on my facebook you should, so that's one thing i did post on my facebook yesterday it was a a picture of so we've been we're, we're working on these um bad bugs that are like from from museums they're about 100 years old they're from ddd pre ddt through to the modern day and we're sequencing their genomes um, but before we do that we are um digitizing each of these bed bugs because the museums don't want them destroyed. So we're, we're digitizing them. We're then non-destructively extracting DNA, redigitizing them, and then sending those specimens back to the museums. There you go. So we, we, so part of it, we decided to see if they auto fluoresce, lots of insects auto fluoresce, lots of arthropods, mm -hmm. just like scorpions, right? You see scorpions, um, people who hold a black light up to them and they shine, that, that's auto fluorescence. So I was curious what bed bugs would do. And it turns out that they have this almost little Tron like. Um, they look like they're in that movie Tron whenever they auto fluoresce because of all the lines. And I stuff. mean, they look so, kind of cute here, but they're yeah, not. Yeah, like cute. the eyes are pretty neat, and the rostrum where they feed, like you see it on that one I on the right. I stab you with that. that Very yeah, sweet. That's, the, that's the feeding part. So that's, a, that's a female <laughs> bed bug. And that, um, yeah, that, I thought that was really cool the way they auto fluoresce. If you zoom in on the eyes, the utidia and, and the eyes, the umatidia are, are really, really cool, you know? Kind still, of yeah. cool. I just wish they wouldn't ruin my life when I do reptile yeah. shows. Just say it. <laughs> well, there's lots of other things that ruin your life on reptile shows. That's true. You're right. Mites, ball pythons, and um, the general public. Crypto. Oh, fuck. Oh, God, yeah, that whole. Yeah. Ugh.
that's why I didn't. I, I was going to get back into hognose snakes because it's not hognose are the first species I ever bred, and I thought they're I was fun. Back into hognose, and then I just the more I hear, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts anymore just due to time. But I think I was listening to one or two of yours. And, I'm traumatized. Uh, I heard you. No, 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 I really enjoyed them. Um, no, it thanks. was. Uh, it was uh, hearing a lot about crypto and hog noses. I was just like, oh god, it's hard. And it's this. hard because like. If, you know, I can like tell people to go fecal test, and I'm like, yeah, it's so cool, right? But like, you really need to do I'm a gastric do wash, gastric lavage, yeah. And, and that's, that's not like a cool, convenient, safe way to no. have a pet, right? So it's, no. it kind of sucks. Yeah, I, I don't fancy that there. You know? So it's it, <sighs> and also, well, well, hognos are they're really cool. Um, I was down in uh, in Knoxville. I think you had Harbin 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 Harbin. Harbin. Yeah. yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, uh, they're they are awesome. Awesome, awesome people. And uh, they got some really, really nice hogno snakes. And I saw a couple there and I was like, mm. and I was Did you do to... it? Just get like a baby fresh out of the egg so it wouldn't have any. No, I trust them. Risk. Like, I think yeah. I, I trust their, their animal. But then, I, then I, I just see the hognose market going in the same way as the ball python. And it's like, mm. yeah. Do you think people are like smorphing them too much? Like, no, but I think, people are, I think a lot of people are just seeing them as money yes. and not, you know, this is, look, like, here's the thing. I like ball pythons and I would happily have a normal ball python because mm -hmm. I think they're cool. Um, I like uh, um, hognose snakes and I'd happily have a normal hognose snake. I think some of the albinos are phenomenal. I think the logistics look really cool. But I just, um, I just think, you know, just that so many people are just seeing it for dollar signs and I'm like, mm hmm yeah, I'm just not really into that there anymore. I like dollar signs. I like it producing animals and selling them, but I don't. I don't like it whenever it's um, and when that's the only reason you have it. And whenever it stops making money, then everything's gone. You know, it's all out the window. Yeah, that's how people treat corn snakes. I don't, every time I go to show, they're like, "Yeah, I used to breed so many of those when palmettos were one thousand dollars, and I don't breed any mm -hmm. now." I'm like, you yeah. like want like two for fun? And they're like, no. <laughs> yeah, like with ball pythons, I I got into ball pythons big way, a big way twice, and I got out of them the first time just due to moving from mm -hmm. the UK to to the US, and I brought one with me. I brought a yellow belly with me that I paid um, a five figure sum for. Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, that's stupid. <laughs> and uh and i got back into them i don't know seven six seven eight years ago just you a friend wanted some boas so he decided to trade me for like bamboos and what the other one ghis back whenever they were worth something mm -hmm. um and i produced all these things and, and i could sell some of them but i found it very difficult to sell a lot of them because people didn't know me for ball pythons mm -hmm. um but i was into them more because i liked the look of them mm -hmm. but also whenever it's not just, well, you just can't have them because you like the look of them. Have one or two if you like the look of them. And I kind of got swept up in it a little bit, but then nobody was buying from me because they don't know me for ball pythons and I don't do shows. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just saw the whole, that kind of area in the hobby just became something that I wasn't really a big fan of. They're very cutthroat. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of infighting, and I just thought, nah, it's not really me. Like I, I saw something yesterday. I was, I was trawling through YouTube at one in the morning when I should have been in bed, and um, there was some ball python thing on, and and the person was complaining that they had to wait three and a half years for their ball python to breed whenever they normally breed them at eighteen months for females. Mm -hmm. and I just thought, yeah, that's not a side of the hobby I really like. That's just the mass production, you know. That's just. It's hard because, like, there are people who I think just like ball pythons. They just like, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. just they want to breed sign because it's fun. But they they're yeah, not cool. worried about it. But like, they're mm -hmm. crushed because like the oversupply, hype, efficiency part of the market just like makes it so they can't sell their like five. Oh, there's, there's like forty five thousand of them on morph market right now. Yeah, forty five thousand ball pythons. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably a, you know, that's a fraction of what a fraction produced. of what's been produced this year. Yeah. You know, yeah, and people might say, yeah, but that's 2,000 or 3,000 less than last month. Yeah, but yeah. also in the last month, we haven't really been able to ship, so people aren't advertising, putting things on, and so, no, that's just crazy numbers. Yeah, it, it is hard. I don't know what to do about it, because I have ball pythons, mm -hmm. too, and mm -hmm. I, I think, like, sometimes I'll go to a show, and I'll sell ball pythons, 
boas, mm -hmm. corn snakes, and like rare colubrids or something. You know what yeah. sells the most? Ball pythons. The corn <laughs> no ball pythons. <laughs> Nobody wants yeah, corn snakes. They think they're the dumbest. The, the, the pyramid scheme is still. You yeah. know, people still think we're, we're, yeah. you know like, we're, we're in you know it's going to go in waves you know okay. and, most people think know, the boas but... are retics they don't even know what boas are <laughs> yeah well there you go <laughs> <laughs> they're like that's a weird retic and i'm like yikes that is a weird retic that's right very good On you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah no I, I as i say i love ball patterns but i i just i can't imagine me i would never get back into them to try and breed them again and uh if i got them it would, i would get one as a desk pet because i keep looking at that pattern this one it's like five Some, grand or please, something like that there but, yes please get one as yeah. a desk pet i think that sounds very beautiful and like nice instead of like mm. whatever that's why but my desk pets are currently the hybrid emerald amazon tree boas so it's kind of like they're kind of a cooler desk pet oh yeah right now yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are, are they sterile like uh we don't know Okay. You know, the, the suggestion of it, but we don't really know. You know, we'll we'll, uh, we'll see. It. You know, in time, I'll try to to pair mine up. But uh, I don't they know. are beautiful anyway. Oh yeah, like the one that I the, the female that I've got is um, she was like orange brown whenever I got her, and she's blue, kind of blue gray now. I'm know. in. Sign me it's up. It's really cool. It's, I'm into blue awesome, snakes you know? in general. It's yeah. If you troll through my instagram you'll find a picture of it but she's, it's really really cool you know it's uh it's it's just shed yesterday again it's just 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 a cool snake you know but they they've got a history of being terrible but this one seems to be doing fine terrible as in like high mortality they crash yeah they crash you know after a couple of years so i don't even i can't even remember when i got this one maybe like three years ago or two years ago but it, it eats fine and sheds fine and does its stuff you know, but I need to put together, you know, the way with children, you put that, you know, every, those pictures of every month, you know, the, as you can mm -hmm. see them aging. I need to do that with this hybrid because then you can see it going from yeah. shitty brown right through orange, through the gray, through the blue. You know, do you think that's cool. why uh, GTP keepers have designers is because they're actually like hybrids. And so like they are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's like, a big part of it because they didn't know as well. Right. They right. Didn't know that in. In, in time, it was, um, you know, they were one species and just like anything, you'd breed what you got to what you got. Because again, you're you're kind of somewhat tr trying to trust the, the people that you, that's a Trinidad tree bow, the white one. This one? Um, yeah, that's Trinidad, yeah. I like that. Kind of, that's kind of cool. This one? Yeah, um, no. Yes. That's a, yeah, that's a hybrid, but that's in a very bad lighting. If you scroll down, you'll see probably better lighting shot. Crappy snake. I feel like Amazon tree bows are getting just in general, or Corrales in general is getting a, I don't know, hype resurgence. They are, you know, I think people seem to be getting into that's it. Yeah. That's there you go. It's, it's, it's not, cool. it's not blue compared to that there. Yeah. So it's kind they of, are cool. Yeah. But it's, I, um, they, they are getting a, they are going through cool. a resurgence. Yeah. Like yeah. I had a wild caught. ATBs when I was like mm -hmm. 15 or 16 or something. Yeah. She was already awesome. gravid, obviously, when I bought her because <laughs> they mm -hmm. come in that way. Yeah. So she was very cool. Yeah. I just, whenever I'm, my collection died, they died too. Right. Yeah. No, I like them. I've, I've got, I've, I've only got a couple of, of Amazons. I've got leopard Amazons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've only got a couple, but I, I really like them. I, I, they're cool. But, you know, because I've, I've got so many Russian burger eye. That I just don't have space for more for the other ones. You know, I've got a whole bunch of emeralds and a thirty Ruschenberger eye or something, and then um, I've got some Grenadensis and I've got Annulatus. <laughs> so I just don't have space for the Portolana, which I like. But, you know. Um, I, I think I skipped some questions, but let's like finish up. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Thank you for being here, though. I really appreciate it. I no, it's happy to be here. Yeah. How is Boas Boas going along? It's going great. So we started that um, a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half ago. It was myself, mm -hmm. Keith McPeak, and Rob Stone. Um, Eric Burke had asked, been asking us for a while, and um, a lot of it was trying to get our time together. Whenever you got three people that are hosting something, oh my God. well, you've been through it yourself, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, it's hard it's to try. Hard. And, it's hard to yeah. try and make time. Um, but we started recording. Uh, and it became a bit easier in the spring of last year because 
if I'm here and my wife and kids are in Oklahoma and I'm at my apartment, mm -hmm. then I can anytime, you know, I can, I can fit that in. Um, whenever we, if we all moved here in July, it was a bit more difficult to kind of turn around and say, right, I'm away for three hours to record something. And, um, it kind of fell by the wayside. So the fact that we didn't have any episodes from July through to December was entirely my fault and I take the full blame for it. But we got back into it in January and I think we just released another episode this week. It's well, we record it and then Eric Burke edits it and, and put, puts it out on the, on the Morelia Python radio kind of network. Um, is it and still then just audio only or is it? Yeah. Okay. So we record it. We re I don't know if it's recorded just audio, like we sit like this here and I can watch everybody, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, I don't think it's been put out like that yet, but I, I should talk to Eric about it, you know, not that, well, maybe, I don't know, whether people want to see each other's face as well. <laughs> so most people it. just play this mm -hmm. like, like a podcast, like I do pull right. the audio yeah. version too, but yeah. I'm just saying pretty much universally, even though it's easier to edit just audio. Yeah that yeah. just having it on youtube there's like a searchability discoverability that's different so yeah it is a good I, um, podcast i should recommend it to everybody in the audience but yeah so we've got you know the way we when, when we started putting it together the idea was that we didn't just want to have a podcast that was this is a whatever boa sigma you keep it like this you breathe it like that you know we wanted mm -hmm. to have a bit more natural history we wanted to have a bit more behavior and go through so that you mm -hmm. know you kind of you, you went through all different aspects so um we recorded we're recording one next week so we've got dennis mcnamara coming on mm. to talk about boas keeping boas in zoo setups zoo, zoo environments you know mm. and talk about conservation and so on because they work uh, dennis is actually just done in the, in the virginia zoo which is about three and a half hours from me mm -hmm. and i was i was there um a couple of months ago at, i was at a pest control technical meeting giving a talk but i nipped over to the zoo because I was buying some enclosures of Dennis and he gave me a tour of the reptile place. It was really cool. And I thought it'd be cool to have Dennis on because I keep some really nice animals behind the scenes that you don't see. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be cool to have him on. Um, we're going to have Ketzel Dwyer. Ketzel Dwyer is going to talk about some of the boa stuff that they've done both in Reptilandia and his various trips and collecting. Reptilandia um, looks so good, by the way. I haven't yeah, been there yet. I can't wait to I, go. I need to because... Um, for a couple of reasons, I need to deliver a parthenogenetic crocodile to them. So last year we had a paper on right. parthenogenesis and crocodiles, you know, which was just, it was crazy. It's the most publicized paper I've ever had, but I've got that sitting in my freezer still. And I want to bring it down there because we want to put a, a little exhibit together, you know, of, of mm -hmm. this kind of phenomenon at, at, at the at Reptilandia. And, and all was fine. Whenever we started that work, it was pre COVID. Um, and I wasn't planning to move to Virginia. Um, so mm -hmm. I thought, right, well, I'll just come down and it was only whatever it is from Tulsa to there, like seven or eight hours, you know, I would mm -hmm. down. Um, it's a bit more difficult now. The drive is a lot longer. Um, so I'll find a way of getting that to them. But uh, I, I really want to go to see it because um, it looks like a really cool place. Like I, I recently got a, an invite to the Reptilandia in Costa Rica because they have the female crocodile that produce parthenogenetically genetically there. Mm -hmm. um, and and Ketzel's he's he's he sold Reptilandia in Costa Rica to set up Reptilandia. Oh, I didn't know, I didn't know Texas. that's cool. Yeah. He should be yeah. fun to talk to. Then he's a cool guy. He's a really cool guy, and he's got well, he's got decades of experience, you know. So he's really a super nice guy. Um, so we're gonna have him coming on. Um, um, Scott Boback, who is a guy that did a lot of the early collecting of the island boas, like the mm -hmm. Cocker K, the West Lagoon K, Snake K. He's going to be coming on. Um, uh, he has Graham Reynolds, who's done a lot of work on Chilobothrus. Um, he's a associate professor at UNC Asheville, but he's the guy, the part of the group that discovered the new boa species a number of years ago, the silver boa or ghost, whatever Chilobothrus species. Mm -hmm. So he's going to come on. Um, I've been talking to um, Robert Henderson, who's the Corallus guy that wrote all of the original Corallus books, I'm trying to convince him. And then we'll, we'll be looking for other. We're trying to record one a month. I think for the three of us, that's it makes sense. That at least for now, we do one a month and get it out, at least on that kind of routine. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever I listen to the other kind of podcasts, it's like episode 537. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time for that, you know? Yeah, uh, you don't. 
they don't necessarily need to be like sometimes podcasts aren't really podcasts. Sometimes they're like industry hangout sessions or whatever. So like yeah. it's okay that they're not they're sort of fluff material because people need content right. while they clean tubs. And then right. some and that's, podcasts yeah, that's should exactly be more, what I listen to. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. should but be rarer because like they're like more curated. Yeah, and I like that. You know, like when you listen to the stuff, at least the most recent stuff with myself and and Keith and Rob. Like Rob stays pretty quiet in the background, and we coax him to come in. But he, Keith and I, it's just like shooting the shit. And yet, I've never met Keith right. in person. You know, we just talk. We just talk snakes, and just he's just just an absolutely wonderful person to talk to. He's just a wealth of of experience, you know. And uh, so we really enjoy that, and be and being able to bring on guests. You know, we had Vin Russo on, and one of them I think was in the last one we did in 2023 was in like June or something like that there. Um, Vin was our guest. And it was great talking to Vin because I've known Vin for years. Hmm. Um, but, you know, Keith and I can bounce stuff off each other really well. And it, uh, I've been getting a, a, a massive amount of feedback about the podcast, which has shocked me because um, I didn't think people would really be listening to it. And um, that's why it took a lot of convincing to get us to do it. And, uh, you know, people are talking about sending messages about how well you know, Keith and I kind of go from a script to, and I'm like, well, there isn't really a script, you know, it's, we just kind of shoot the shit, you know, so mm -hmm. it's been a lot of fun, you know, and the day it becomes not fun is the day I will stop responding to their emails. <laughs> <laughs> Which but is I enjoy fair, doing, right? I, en I enjoy doing podcasts because I, it, for me, it's a couple of hours of talking snakes and having fun. You know, I, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook groups and stuff anymore. And I, I don't go to yeah. a lot of shows. But I, I, you know, I've got a hundred and something snakes and I have had for the last 30 years, you know, so. I'm yeah, so especially if you don't go to shows. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. People like give podcasts a lot of grief or the things that aren't podcasts are like just YouTube only lives. They don't even mm -hmm. have like an audio yeah. RSS feed. I'm just like, it's fine. This is like, a, okay. Like the human condition is full of many travesties. Too many podcasts yeah. is not <laughs> one of them. No, because you know, you know, I want to happen. find something to listen to. You know, if right. I'm in the shower in the morning, it's nice having something going on in the background, you know, it's, uh, that I can listen to. And, and I listen to a lot of diverse stuff. I, as I say, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts at the moment due to time, but I really like Zach's... Um, Colubrid, uh, Colubrid. Colubrid, yeah, because I love Colubrids. I just, the only Colubrids I have are some desert king snakes. Uh, and that's, that's just cool. because, it, and that's because I I caught desert king snakes in um, on um, on uh, Portal Road uh, in um, in Arizona, and I really liked them. I thought they were really cool whenever I saw them. And I've got a friend there who, um, who's a very famous colubrid and, and was a very famous boa breeder, and he was like, "Yeah, I've got some locality ones I'll send you." So um, I've got yeah. some little desert kings, and they're neat. I, I really like them. You know, and I found that there's albinos and anarthristic or exantics and stuff, and I had to resist the um, urge to, <laughs> to go into those. But um, I, I think calibers are great. I, I think corn snakes are great. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I like I like palmettos. I think they look cool. I don't um, like their eyeballs that fall out. Yeah, but that's a problem with many snakes. You know, whatever they. Yeah, I don't like any eyeballs. There's some out. there's some <laughs> ocular issue that says <laughs> I don't want to retain this important. You know. Um, <laughs> Uh, this important uh, yeah. system that yeah I could fall out of my head, but yeah, but yeah, I I, I like them. But then again, I like subox as well, and subox are like. But uh, subox are like balanced bulgy eyes. It's like a yeah. correctly proportion to their giant it's head. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> whereas, beautiful. Whereas, uh, or like the Malagasy cat-eyed snakes. That's a big yeah. eye. That's eye for yeah. days. You could like yeah, ski off like, that that's eyeball. Why I like neonate neonate corallus because they had really really big eyes. You know, too big for their head. So I don't like anime, so it's, but it's kind of like that anime person, you yeah. know, the eyeball they're too big for their. Or like, their have you seen? I mean, you've seen them, like baby longicata do the same thing. Oh yeah, giant yeah. eyeballs, which we didn't get I into. Did we'll get in, I had a wonderful longicata, and I sold my longicata to move when I was moving from Ireland, uh, Rally to no, oh, moving from Rally to uh, to Oklahoma. Do you know what line they I were? Sold them. Uh, I could find out. I'm one of these people that still has a hotmail account. And I, could go back. <laughs> I could go back and I, mean, I could find out who sold them to me. But long and are all the same line. Right. Right. Because they were like this one import that was. It was like, yeah, six animals came in kind of thing. Right. So mm -hmm. when people talk about the zero line in Europe, that mm -hmm. is derived from Vin's collect. Vin's got zeros and just doesn't advertise them. 
you know, right. that they're all in the US. That's why people are now popping out these patternless ones, you know, because the, they're Wink. all here. So um, uh, they're really nice, but I, I but there has been line breeding to make the yellow ones and the but right. I, 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 I really like line because I just don't have space for them at the moment. You know, last question: can, Do you th have you been on iNaturalist for Longicata? I haven't. I, the last I was on iNaturalist whenever I was actually recording the last Boas episode, looking at Sanzinia, mm -hmm. um, because I love Sanzinia. Um, but I haven't looked for Longicata. I should do. So it's have you? Yeah, it's really funny that mm -hmm. the ones from Ecuador are the ones that look like Longicata, not the ones from. You know where it would be illegal. So, so like, yeah. Yeah. wink. Um, <laughs> that's another one where I know. Uh, yeah, I, I think things came in very differently as well. Remember that because they were brought in from somewhere doesn't mean that they were collected from somewhere. From right, but place. I think they like yeah. illegally floated a bucket of Longicotta across that little bay and then brought it through. Yeah, but uh, look at Bolivia the recent legally. You know, what, look at the recent Russian burger that came into the country as Trinidad's, and they're not Trinidad's. Wink. They're, <laughs> Yeah, they came in as yeah. Nobody can give me paperwork to show me that they were, came from Trinidad or that they're Russian burgeri. So I'm uh, and I've seen the pictures of those animals in Europe. So they yeah. went into Europe and then came over, and uh, I can guarantee they came in as Hortolanus via Suriname. I would imagine. Right. You know, but uh, it's yeah, well, fine. It is, it, it is what it is. Yeah, but it's just funny because you can see zeros in the wild also. Mm -hmm. Oh it, really? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. Cool. Like like patternless looking mm -hmm. things up in trees and stuff. It's yeah. just fun. That would be like a fun topic. Like all deep launch got to dive. Also, yeah, I like those a lot. I, I mm -hmm. should get them again at some point. I need to. I need to move out some project. Even though I just got into more <laughs> stupid project. I got into. <laughs> I fell into Colombian rainbow bows in a stupid oh, way. Oh no! You know, so. I love. I, I like everything. I love them. But yeah, like, there's I'm definitely saying. like you have to prioritize, right? Like you're like. If I'm gonna get ten of these, something else got to go, and so yeah, see, that's my, that's been my problem. I haven't done that, you know. I've kind of okay. Just, you just keep adding ten more. Yeah, and I like the diversity. You know, yeah. I don't like the monoculture kind of thing. You know, I like the I like the kind of diversity of what we what I've got here. I just, I'm always you know, like, I just need, go ahead. And what, what what I do is I get stuff and then I send stuff to friends. So like my friend that looked after all of my collection prior to that, he had got out of snakes. And I was like, yeah, but and he, and he saw my stuff when I was in Tulsa. And he's like, he thought about getting back into snakes. And I was like, I will send you all of my Darwin carpets. And then oh. and then I sent him all of my Womas. And then I sent you got him, him right back in. all of my Colombian uh, Colombian Imperator, you know? So mm -hmm. I said, you just keep them and feed them. And then we will split the offspring. Yeah. I mean, that's a good scam, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, my problem is just like, I want to selectively breed so bad because that's how I like started mm -hmm. off with, but like imperator boas, like mm -hmm. how I was trained mm -hmm. mentally that yeah. like, I, I need 40 of them. Yeah. You don't find really the like. phenotypes that I want and then like sell the, what the phenotypes I don't want. You just, just have to be smart. You can do that with single pairings, right? You just <sighs> need to be smart that hold on to them long enough for a couple of months until they start showing some real development. And then sell the rest, you know, and just keep. It's very difficult to just say, I'm just going to keep one. So last year, whenever I produced these five litters unintentionally, amazingly, most of them have stayed here with me. Uh oh. Because I'm like, you know, because they were really rare things that don't exist. And I'm like, well, if I sell them, you know. So, um, yeah, it becomes a problem whenever you start holding back 25 animals a year. Whoops. But you just have to be more sensible and say, well, what's realistic, you know? I hope, we'll and then move things out that. whenever you can that, yeah. that are being replaced. You know? Yeah, like with corn snakes, I probably bought I don't know twenty or something, and they make a million, right? So then you're mm -hmm. like, we can't keep a million, but it took you know fifty or something animals produced to hit one that I thought was like the exemplary selectively bred mm -hmm. version of that trait. So mm -hmm. I I literally think I probably needed to breed fifty of them to make one, but then that's right. the one that'll be like yeah. the main source of the line. Yeah, that's it. And then you just sell yeah. the other 49 <laughs> and give them away. Or give them away to King Snakes at this point. <laughs> I'm kidding. I would never, I would do it all the time, actually. Um, anyway, <laughs> before that's I get in I trouble. 
right? My king snake is getting fat. I need a more king snakes, honestly. Because like, and corn snakes make all kinds of like d- dud babies anyway, like yeah. dome oh, heads yeah. and shorts. Yeah, now that's, that's also why I, I've read for tortoises because they love to consume oh. the odd. I fed like, I fed some stillborn Trinidad Rischenberger eye to my redfoots not that long ago. And uh, it's kind of funny when you just put a pile of dead babies in the middle of it and they just they go in start and start noshing on them. Oh, yeah, totally. They love it. They come back an hour later and everything's gone. <laughs> That's you awesome. <laughs> All right, sir. Indeed. Thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, welcome. check out Boas, right. Boas, really Boas, Boas and Boa Booth on Instagram, not Facebook. He doesn't want to go there. And yeah, I don't really, I don't really, I rarely respond to friends on Facebook. Okay. Nope. Ignore her Facebook. Do you have any ball pythons for sale on Morph Market currently? I've got uh, 317 <laughs> currently in the auction. <laughs> they're all stranger clowns and they're, yeah. Fuck, dude. <laughs> right in the heart. No, I'm here. I'm here for it. And then, but you'll have boa litters this year, maybe yeah. for sale? Or are you yeah, starting, all in, starting the end of May. End of yeah. May, everybody. Thank you. Uh, we did it. Thanks, chat. Yeah. Hopefully everybody gets some more uh, boas after this. That's my dream. All right. That's the way I I agree with that. We did it. (laughs) Bye, everybody.